just give me a second. Okay, so uh, before Dr. Guha need to start, let me give a, a short introduction. So thanks everyone to join our 2023 uh, APS and the CM, you know, user meeting. So, so, you know, unfortunately this year we're still on the virtual meeting. Hopefully next year we'll have a chance, you know, do everything on site after APSU, you know, come back. So uh, yeah, our workshop is a joint workshop between, a, a, you know, APS and CM. This is a workshop number 12. So focus on microelectronics. So today we're going to talk about many you know interesting research you know, happening uh, either in APS Nano Center and also other you know uh, DOE facility work on uh, or also you know national facility you know it's you know, beyond DOE um, microelectronics device material system wise you know co design and also uh, you know uh, uh, the things have a very strong connection to in you know semiconductor industry. So, okay, so let's uh, start the, uh, you know, the first uh, presenter. So uh, Dr. Guha gonna give us uh, like opening remarks. Uh, before that, I give a, just a very short introduction about uh, Dr. Uh, Sab Sabreka Guha. So uh, Professor Guha right now is professor for uh, Prisca School of uh, Molecular Engineering in U U Chicago. He also senior advisor for physical science engineer director for Argon. Uh, he got his PhD in uh, 1991 for uh, University of South California. And then, you know, before he joined Argon and U Chicago, he spent a, more than 20 years career in IBM. And so, you know, especially he lead the pioneer work to lead into IBM, the high chem material developments for a uh, semiconductor industry. And then uh, Dr. Guha lead the uh, nano, nano Center from 2015 to 19. And then, you know, he also member of a, a, a National Academy Engineer and also fellow of a, you know, Material Research Society, I mean, American Physical Society. And also, uh, he also, uh, you know, re recipient award 2015 the prize for industry application for physics. So at uh, UChicago and Argonne, Dr. Guha interests the focus on the discovery science in area nanoscale material architecture, you know, of energy sensing for future information processing. So, yeah, go ahead. All right. Well, thank you very much for um, asking me to open this um, this um, this uh, session. Uh, glad to be here today, uh, virtually, uh, and thank you for the kind introduction. So, um, as you all probably know, there is a lot of interest in the U.S. in um, sort of regenerating microelectronics research uh, because um, microelectronics is, you know, there is a there is a feeling that the U.S. is falling behind. Uh, you know, this field is rapidly progressing and uh, we want to make up for any ground that uh, we perceive we may have lost. Um, so just to kind of give you a little summary, there is uh, roughly about... Uh, you know, $50 billion that uh, Congress uh, approved uh, that has been appropriated uh, through the Department of Commerce uh, for microelectronics, uh, bringing it up. Of this amount, about $39 billion or so, this is approximate numbers, uh, are going towards sort of more manufacturing. But $11 billion is going towards um, R and D, um, and this money will go towards uh, funding a uh, prototyping center, integration center, uh, an advanced packaging center, a metrology center at NIST, uh, a few manufacturing institutes focused on microelectronics. In addition to that, the Department of Defense also has announced calls for microelectronics commons. Again, this is a probably like a couple billion dollars or so. I forget the exact number. And then the Department of Energy um, is also expected to, though they have not been appropriated for this money yet, is expected um, or wants to have four um, microelectronics centers um, across the U.S. Um, and I, my guess is that they will be along the lines of the quantum centers, right? And they have asked for $60 million to Congress in their budget and uh, to, to the president, rather, president's budget request. Um, so this is the climate, right? So there's a lot of interest and enthusiasm in trying to push microelectronics research. So I will quickly talk a bit about uh, 
you know, what is driving all this, right? Three things are driving this uh, push for uh, new innovations to come down the pipeline for microelectronics. The first is that uh, computing processing systems um, need to be much more efficient than they are today. Uh, so just as one example, if you look at the uh, petascale machine today, you know, Aurora at Argon consumes about 60 megawatts of energy. Now, if we want to go to zeta scale high performance computing, so 1000x um, improvement in performance, if we want to be responsible sustainability wise, then perhaps you know we can take a 10x hit in more energy needed. Uh, but that would still need, need a 100x improvement in energy efficiency. Right now, we don't know how to accomplish that. <laughs> The other thing I will note is that in computing today, memory has lacked logic development, processor logic development. And this has led to what's called the memory bottleneck. The computing speed today is, um, is controlled by the time required to get data in and out of memory. So there is a big drive to figure out ways of increasing connectivity in these systems. And the third thing to see of note is that if you look at the future, systems will be fragmented into chiplets. Okay? Um, these chiplets will be the CPU, the GPU, various kinds of accelerators, various memories. And they will sit on large panel substrates. These panel substrates could be organic materials. They could be ceramics. They could be glass, right? And these chiplets will communicate with each other through extremely fast interconnect so that our ideal is that the intra-chiplet communication speed will be about the same as the inter-chiplet communication speed. Now, we don't know how to make these large panels or how to connect them in the way that we desire. So there will be a lot of research coming along these lines, which is called heterogeneous integration, right? And if you look at future, what is today on a rack in a server will end up being on a miniaturized panel, right? And then the, I want to make two more points, which is where Argon comes in is that microelectronics has lots of open challenges it needs to meet if it needs to keep moving forward at the rate that we want it to. But the people who know the relevant problems for microelectronics are often not the same people who have the skills to solve them. And the people who have the skills to solve them are not working on the relevant problems. So these two communities need to talk more. Argon comes from the community that has the skills to solve a lot of these problems, but there needs to be more awareness. We are getting there. There is, as you know, there is an LDRD call. There's lots of interest. There's workshops such as this. That's where we need to go. And the second thing to keep in mind is that we are running out of the seed corn of our knowledge in physics of physics and chemistry and materials um, needed to be able to build the microelectronic systems of the future that we wish to. So there's a lot of basic science work that needs to be done. So let me get to the next slide. Um, so what are these fundamental science challenges? Right? And um, I picked what we think are five of the key fundamental challenges uh, for material scientists, for materials physicists, materials chemists, transport physicists, et cetera, to work on, solid state physicists. So the first is the physics, chemistry, and computational science of microelectronic materials that needs to be fast, that needs to be accurate. And we want to capture a few things here. We want to be able to model non-equilibrium configurations. We can't do that, reaction pathways, things like that. And we want it to be able to model defective materials, materials with grain boundaries, materials with dislocations, dopants, et cetera. 
We are not good at it. Okay. The second is modeling complex processes across scales. So let's just take a plasma deposition system or a plasma etch system. Okay. It's etching a very complicated profile. So what are the scales of computation here? Ideally, you want to build accurate models of the entire process. So A, there is the molecular dynamics of you know, the reaction chemistries that are going on. B, there is the multi-physics of thermal physics, you know, gases flowing, so fluid dynamics, um, plasmas, etc. And then the third is then putting all this together to figure out the actual etching of, let us say, a complicated three-dimensional structure to find out to predict with high accuracy how this material will etch. So these are the kinds of complex across the scale modeling challenges that we face for the future. And then there is AI guided materials discovery, right? And there's a lot of enthusiasm here. But the goal should not be here that, hey, I have AI and then, you know, I'm just going to shove it down the throat of something or the other. You need to do this carefully, cautiously, need to show that it works. My own take is that AI-guided materials discovery will not happen without there being very large public databases that are open and available for training. This is not happening today. Most people, most groups have their own little databases and they publish their own little papers. But if you look at the impact of machine learning, the ones where there has truly been impact have been the ones where there were large free public databases. So ImageNet, you know, databases like those provided the guidance for developing facial recognition. Um, machine learning models that are very accurate, same with handwriting recognition. And if you look at the physical sciences world, the latest success has been protein folding. And again, it is because there are very large databases. So we as a materials community and user facilities are perfect places for this, need to start developing this notion of having very, very large free databases for training. Without that, it's just gonna be a toy. Yeah. The second item is atom scale deterministic nanofabrication in three dimensions. We rely heavily on two-dimensional lithography, but the microelectronic world is moving to 3D. Litho lithography was specialized for 2D, but we need new techniques that are more capable for 3D fabrication. Direct right is one, Example, there are others. The other one is atomic scale deposition and etching of complex three-dimensional structures. Atomic layer de deposition has revolutionized microelectronics manufacturing, uh, but trying to do selective atomic layer deposition, that's a new challenge for the future with a wide variety of selective chemistries trying to etch an, on an atomic level on conformal surfaces. That's an emerging area, okay. Number three is carrier and thermal transport physics for 3D multi-scale heterogeneous environments. We're not there yet. I'll highlight one here, which is thermal physics. If we move to three-dimensional structures in microelectronics, we really need to be able to remove and manage the heat, and we really need to have accurate thermal physics models for structures that are so heterogeneous that you have dielectrics, you have metals, you have semiconductors, you have organics, all within nanometers of one another, you know, on length scales that are smaller than the phonon mean, mean three parts. So we need to both understand that physics and we need new strategies for heat removal and materials for heat removal. Without this, 3D microelectronics will be very, very difficult. Okay. So of course, the physics of transport and polycrystalline electronics, small interconnects, how do we deal with defects, its consequences? Organic substrates is another area, okay? Because as I said, these chiplets ideally should sit on organic substrates, but can you make organic substrates? 
that have the mechanical and thermal properties that approach that of inorganic materials. And then looking at new state variables for logic and memory, this brings me to point number four, which is new physics-based computational models and architectures, a completely new way of looking at the way we are moving power that we're delivering, the heat that's generated, and the information that we are creating. Right? In its essence, this is what you need to optimize in a processing circuit processor, and how do you accomplish it? So there are big challenges, I think, on the microarchitecture side of this, and also the hardware side of this. And then finally, it's the characterization of three-dimensional structures. Right? Um, atomic scale, chemical and physical resolution in X, Y, and Z. Um, we don't know how to do this today in semiconductor manufacturing. But we are starting to do these things in places like the APS beam lines. And especially with the APS upgrade coming, you're going to be able to look at nanometer scale objects in you know, almost millimeter scale, perhaps hundreds of micron scale volumes, right? So tremendous power. You want to be able to do this non-destructively and with high Z and X and Y resolution. Now you need this eventually in industry, but first we need to show these processes in research. This is an ideal place for Argon to take leadership, right? With the APS upgrade, tremendous things are possible. The second area is in up operando studies, right? Of dynamically driven processes. Uh, this is the direction a lot of electron microscopy is getting very exciting in. And um, you all are probably familiar with ultra-fast electron microscopy, um, where a laser is the trigger uh, for, and you look at some kind of optical response of the material. Uh, but voltage-triggered um, events is, is important for microelectronics. And um, at the CNM at Argonne has just developed this technique. Uh, and it is there in the ultra-fast electron microscope. So I believe that tools like this will become really important going forward uh, for microelectronics. Okay. Uh, so I think with this, I think let me just show some examples here of work that's going on at Argonne. I just picked a few. Uh, this recently, we were able to get quite a bit of funding from DOE um, related to microelectronics research. Uh, there are two projects here, one that I'm involved in, which is in trying to find ultra-dense, near-perfect memory for microelectronics. Second one is Threadworks, which, uh, which focuses on a very important task that is looking at machine learning approaches to extracting data for, at very high data rates of the kind of data rates that state-of-the-art sensors in, say, uh, photon science or nuclear physics or high-energy physics might need. I talked about the advanced characterization with the APS upgrade. These capabilities, for the first time in the world, will be used, available. It can be tremendously exciting. Um, and then there is this example on the on the right that you see from the uh, voltage triggered. Uh, I don't know. Can you guys see the screen? Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm going to skip that. But um, but um, there is you know the the voltage triggered work is that machine is working. Um, so uh, you know I believe uh, the team has been able to demonstrate responses in dynamic imaging mode down to the nanosecond regime. Uh, and of course, in the stroboscopic mode, um, it's, it's much faster than that in the diffraction, diffraction mode rather, okay? And, and I think that's the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to, to take any questions that might be there. Okay, great. Thanks, uh, Dr. Guha. So any, any question, you know, for 
So, uh, yeah, I have a very general question, you know, Dr. Guhas, because you mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, potentially DOE, maybe think about next year. So it's it, it going to be more, more so for follow the, uh, the format, you know, like the quantum center, right, for this uh, microelectronics. This, center. this is what I'm guessing. I don't know, yeah. you know. Okay. So, so what, 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 what kind of like uh, the center are gonna focus on more, um, you know, more um, um, fundamental part, or are they also gonna have a very strong connection to other, you know, like uh, industry or other, you know, you know, national I, agency I, like NIST or something. My sense is that they will focus on fundamental part. You know, this is Office of Science, but they will ask uh, to connect across co-design. So, you know, how does basic energy sciences related work connect with things that are relevant to Oscar, right? The, 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 the computing directorate. So they will look for co-design, but I think the focus will be on basic science, which More is because... the one that's needed. There's already enough people, enough funding looking at the applied stuff. Oh yeah, sure, sure. I think uh, the NIST, uh, you know, will have a very big R and D fund for the from the Chip Act. I think today we also have a speaker from NIST, to maybe talk about mythology. So yeah, yeah, that's good to know about as a scope for for you know shooting for next year. Uh, yeah, I think the timing is per pretty good because APS right now is uh, down for upgrade. So you know after next summer, <laughs> hopefully APS will you know open reopen and also all the new capability or exciting capability you mentioned about, uh, you know, uh, characterization, imaging, microscopy, or, you know, for dynamic or for even this a driven system, I think uh, will be available for, you know, where's user and also uh, for research group. I think that there are many exciting opportunity to do. So, so a lot I see, of time, yeah. I see, I see. Uh, so any question from the audience? Yeah, you, yeah, go, go ahead. Go ahead. Surprising. Thank you so much for the presentation. So, in particular, regarding the characterizations in three dimensions, we know in the two dimensional uh, atomic resolution is not an issue. So, my question is what the uh, resolution you need for all three dimensions for the, oh, for the device you're working on? For characterization, I think eventually, you know, if you can get sub nanometer would be great. Okay. So that including the uh, boost structure and chemistry. Ideally, yeah. Okay. Ideally. So uh, also you prefer the non-destructive method? Yeah, typically people prefer non-destructive, right? Because ideally, but of course, you're not going to be able to do that all the time, right? I mean, okay. Uh, but I think the important part, the most important part is Z resolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Okay, yeah, so th this is not a, a question, it's a more comment, I think, you know, thank you, Subratic, um, for pointing out so many important, uh, you know, and very relevant uh, uh, topics, especially, you know, materials aspect um, to the microelectronics. I, I couldn't agree more. And I also personally believe, uh, uh, you know, the fundamental research is still the key. And uh, unfortunately, even NSF is uh, emphasizing a lot of applications nowadays. Right. And yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, let's hope, yeah. You know, the materials uh, fundamental study is still the bottleneck for the next generation, extremely small and the 3D right. structures, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. So, yeah, uh, we have any question from the audience? All right, let me see the chat. Yeah, no, 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 so nothing in the chat. Okay, if that's, you know, let's uh, move on to the, you know, next one. But yeah, before that, let's uh, thank uh, Dr. Guha again for the nice opening remarks. So, <laughs> it's, pre it's pretty good. It's very, very high level overview for many things. So, very, very, very exciting. So. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, move uh, to our like uh, you know uh, next speaker. Let me, okay, so before that, let me pull out this uh, bio. Okay, so our next speaker is Professor Joshua Young from uh, uh, University of South uh, California. So before that, I, give, I also want to give a little short bio about Joshua. Although like uh, you know, a lot of people in the field, you know, really know Joshua because he's one of the you know leading figure in the field. So. 
Uh, uh, professor Joshua Young right now is full professor, Department Electro uh, Electron Computer Engineer in uh, USC. And he obtained his PhD degree from University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2007. And then he spent eight years at uh, HP Labs uh, between 2007 to 15, leading an emerging material device team for memory and computing. And then, uh, you know, uh, he joined uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst between 2015 and 2020 and uh, as a professor, also ECE department before he joined uh, uh, South uh, California. He, his current research right now, a very interesting post CMOS hardware for in-memory computing, neuromorphic computing, machine learning, artificial intelligence. So uh, Joshua really hold a lot of uh, amazing number of, uh, you know, granted or about a pending, you know, US patent. Uh, I think among two, already like uh, for MRAM, already licensed by the, you know, you know, the world leading semiconductor company. I'm assuming that's uh, probably Intel or <laughs> you can tell. But, and then, you know, also patent on uh, RAM transfer to memory uh, manufacturer for production de deployments. And also, also patent on neuromorphic computing and uh, leading to a fast growing startup company recently. He served also a social editor of Science at Once. He is also funding chair of IEEE a numer for computing, a technical committee. He also elected to IEEE fellow for his uh, contribution for resistor switching from, uh, from numer for computing. And all, he, he also elected to, to National Academy or inventor for fellow and uh, for, for his uh, contribution. So, okay, let's go ahead, Joshua. Thank you. I hope I, hope I didn't miss any, any major- oh, No, no, thank you. It's, it's uh, already too long. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, you know, for the introduction and uh, um, you know, thank you, Hua, and uh, all other um, uh, organizers for putting together this wonderful um, symposium. I'm uh, very happy to see so many good friends here. Um, so uh, the topic I'm going to talk about today is a memory with thousands of conductance levels for analog computing. Um, so first, let's look at the motivation. You know, as everyone um, knows that, uh, you know, probably have seen such figure before, um, the energy consumption for computing is not sustainable. Um, everybody knows that. I'm not sure everybody knows that the two major contributors to such increase are from first a network, basically data transfer, and then second, the data center. So to solve such a problem, we need to really rethink uh, how to compute, for example, using new computing paradigm with uh, uh, less energy consumption and where to compute, for example, to do more computing on the edge where the data is generated. So in fact, there are you know, already such trend we know we are in the world trying to connect everything on the edge, every device on the edge. The world is analog and the signal generated are analog. And very soon we are facing this uh, analog data deluge. Um, so much analog data, so it is not feasible to be all converted um, into digital to process because that conversion costs too much energy and time cons consume, uh, consumption. And also it is not, uh, practical to uh, transfer the data into data center to process as well, because so much data and uh, transferring the data from edge to center will cost 10 times more energy than processing it locally. So that's why we needed to process the data in analog domain as much as possible. We needed to process the data at edge as much as possible. And we need a lot of analog circuit, analog devices on the edge. Analog circuit become increasingly more important. However, analog circuits are more important, uh, more, more uh, pricey. Um, say if you have a chip with only 10% uh, analog portion, but that 10% analog portion will consume 90% of the total design time. Um, why is that? This is a typical circuit design flow chart um, from the concept to the actual design, to the tape out, to the fabrication, to the measurement. Usually this cycle takes about half a year. And for analog circuit, usually it takes two to three iterations to make it fully function. So 
this is too um, expensive. Um, how does the digital system deal with it? For the digital circuit design, they have a great helper, which is the FPGA. If, uh, if someone who are not familiar with the FPGA, it is just a, a general purpose circuit. It has a lot of uh, basic digital components on that circuit, but they are not necessarily uh, connected yet. So then if you have a certain specific digital circuit design, you can use the routing network on the FPGA to connect the basic, basic digital circuit into a certain um, digital uh, design. And then you can prototype your digital design within hours instead of years. And uh, in fact, FPGA is so advanced um, for many applications, you can just take FPGA and uh, uh, program it as a general purpose uh, a digital circuit to just use it without uh, having go to a fab to make a, a, a application a specific integrated circuit, which is ASIC. So FPGA plays a great, very important role in the advance of digital circuit. Can we have a similar thing for analog circuit? That would be field programmable analog arrays, FPAs. With the FPAs, you may prototype your analog design within hours. And if it's large enough, you can even use it as a general purpose analog circuit. That will be wonderful. As you can imagine, um, people have been thinking this for a while. And there are some early uh, version of FPA that's shown here. So in general for FPAA circuit, the basic units are called cabs, the configurable analog blocks. You have many of them. And inside each cab, you have uh, some uh, basic analog components for amplification, integration, differentiation, addition, subtraction, multiplication, so on and so forth. But those components are not uh, connected, connected yet. When you need to use them in a certain design, you can use something called a um, reconfigurable routing network to connect those analog components together for a certain design. So those connections, including the local connection inside caps and also the global connection outside of the caps. Um, in the early version, such routing network are usually a volatile passing transistors. So that's why you will need a non-volatile memory on the chip to remember your connection pattern, remember the configuration, uh, which is your design. And later there have been a, a fantastic development uh, uh, which used uh, floating gate transistors to serve as a routing network. So such floating gate devices are non-volatile so that you do not need to unchip a non-volatile memory anymore. That is a, a good progress. Um, but uh, as you can imagine, floating gate device you suffer from the common problems of floating gate devices, such as too high voltage, too short endurance, and uh, um, too uh, large energy consumption, so on and so forth. So basically, um, for FPA circuit, the major challenge has been the lack of appropriate analog components. And then the question is, how about memristors? Um, as you all know, you know, memristors, uh, when you use it as a um, memory, also called a RM, um, is an analog device. And uh, we have been using memristors uh, for computing um, as the focus of my research group in the last few years. Some of the major results are uh, shown here, which can be categorized into three major groups. So in the first group, we're trying to build up machine learning accelerators. In this case, we're just using the static memory state of the device um, to accelerate 
uh, machine learning with improved speed and energy efficiency. Um, but those devices are not just a static device. They are actually um, device with a fantastic nonlinear dynamics, very similar to what happens in the synapse and the neurons. That's why uh, the second group of effort we're doing is to utilize such nonlinear dynamical behavior of the device to develop artificial synapse, artificial neurons, artificial dendrites, then put them together to build a, a biorealistic neural network. The goal here is to um, get advanced intelligence, something close to natural intelligence. And in the third category, we're mainly trying to build a tool set for intelligent systems. Um, one of the example is actually a, a memorist-based FPA as shown here. So uh, for a memorist-based FPA in this demonstration, we show that we actually can build uh, something uh, to mimic our hearing system. And in our hearing system, you know, we have our ear to uh, hear some uh, voice. Usually the voice has a multiple frequency components mixed in it. And our ear can decompose such mixed uh, frequency signal into um, different frequencies and then send some fre such frequency components into the brain, which is a neural network that can identify what kind of frequency components are there and how much of each. Basically identify the signal pattern and uh, um, recognize the voice. So for a memorist-based FPAA, we can do a similar thing. Uh, first, uh, we can have this uh, band pass filters that can decompose the mixed input signal into different frequency component. Then the frequency component can be sent into a memorist-based neural network, which can recognize uh, the frequency component pattern and uh, um, you can then recognize the signal. For example, uh, if you know, we can just program those memories to um, let it behave like a, a different uh, band filter to filter different band uh, frequency signal. Uh, for example, if uh, this signal has these two frequency component, then after the filter, these two signal will be the strongest. And you can program the memory array so that uh, um, the neurons can uh, be corresponded to different uh, uh, frequency pattern combination. Um, so then, for example, this combination will trigger the uh, firing pattern of this neuron. Then eventually, you see only this neuron has a signal over the threshold. Then you can recognize uh, you know, what frequency component here and the combination pattern. So in this example, memoristas are playing three major roles. The, figure, uh, the first role is analog filter, as shown here. And um, this is a passive RC filter. So in the traditional way, you have a fixed resistor, then you have a, a different uh, size of capacitors so that you can have a different RC uh, combination to response uh, uh, to different uh, frequency uh, signal. Um, so now we know for a memory state, you can change the resistance freely, and then you can fix your capacitor, just use a memory state and one capacitor. You can change the memory state resistance to get a different RC combinations to respond to different frequency. So then you only have two components, one R, one C, instead of a hundreds or thousands of components to build a filter. And then the second major role of a memory state here are serving as a routing network. In this case, you just need a binary switch um, with a very large on ratios. And the third role the memory state play are the uh, synapse in this neural network. And uh, so this demonstration is still relatively small demonstration. And uh, in order to make FPA real and uh, to have real impact, 
we need a large scale FPA. So in order to build a large scale FPA, what do we need? We need a first large cross bar array, and then we need uh, for the um, neural network, we need a device with low switching current analog behavior. And um, also for the analog components such as a filter, you need uh, many, many conductance levels in the device. So next I'm going to show where we are um, regarding such requirements. First, a large crossbar array. This is the crossbar array we demonstrated uh, uh, five years ago. Um, so here we demonstrated a 128 by 64 array. And uh, the CMOS part was made of course in the foundry, but the memristor was integrated in the university lab. And uh, um, this shows the latest uh, progress. Um, and in this case, we made the array size uh, about 10 uh, eight times larger up to 256 by 256 and fully integrated on CMOS, meaning both the CMOS front end and the uh, memory the back end were done in the standard foundry. So, um, and the memory array, um, you know, each of the device can be programmed uh, analogly use uh, the on-chip driving circuit as shown here, those are the experimental data of programming the entire array with a um, you know, very, very high yield. And um, even the device actually, they have this, uh, the, the uniformity across the entire wafer is extremely good as shown here, um, the very narrow distribution uh, of a, a device uh, programmability across the entire wafer. Um, in fact, I have some of the wafers here um, shown. Um, so this basically shows uh, for uh, the memory acceleration application, we are pretty much ready to make the first generation product uh, as it has been demonstrated um, in the foundry, fully integrated uh, and uh, with uh, uh, great uniformity and yield. Of course, this doesn't mean um, there's no uh, fundamental research needed to be done anymore. So for the first generation product, this is great, but uh, we wanted to have a better, better performance. Uh, you know, for neural network application, as we already know, um, it's quite different from the memory application um, in terms of, uh, you are operating all the devices in the larger array in parallel simultaneously. So each device needed to have a low current and high resistance so that the total current would not saturate your um, periphery circuit and the total energy consumption can be low. But traditionally, um, the device has uh, um, abruptive switching behavior, relatively high current, um, this can be used as a routing network in FPA, but not very suitable for neural network in the FPA. For neural network, we need to develop a new type of devices um, to achieve low current and gradual switching. And fortunately, we find that uh, by replacing one of the uh, electrode material from either platinum, tantalum to ruthenium, and we find the device suddenly changes switching behavior with very gradual on switching, gradual off switching, and also the current level is reduced by two orders of magnitude. So this is more suitable for certain applications. And we wanted to understand what's going on. Is this related to Ruthenia? Um, so in this demo, in fact, we made devices with a different oxide layer, but all the devices have a ruthenium electrode. As you can see, um, as long as you have a ruthenium electrode, regardless of the oxide, you get similar switching behavior, all gradual switching and low current. So this is related to ruthenium. And then uh, we want to know how and what's going on. In fact, we did this study um, with uh, Yuzi actually, um, 
uh, some time ago. And uh, uh, at, in Argonne National Lab, uh, the TEM was done first, the ex situ TEM. Um, in this experiment, we take three devices, we put them into different states, pristine state, low resistance state, high resistance state. And um, then we cross section them, um, look at TEM. As you can see here, for the device in uh, pristine state, um, the ruthenium and platinum electrode are well se separated by the oxide layer. And for the device, they were switched to low resistance state before the TM sample preparation. You can see ruthenium actually penetrated through the oxide, reaching the top electrode. And for the device, there was a switched back to high resistance state before the TM preparation. You can see ruthenium is cleaned up from the oxide layer. And so this is the ex-situ TEM. We also did the in-situ TEM. I think you did this. Um, so you can see for a, a single device um, that can be switched on and off in the TEM. Um, you can see in the pristine state, um, the oxide layer is clean. And after the device is switched to the low resistance state in situ, you can see the ruthenium filament actually grow and uh, are reaching the top electrode. And for the same device, there was a, a switched back to its off state. You can see the ruthenium filaments are gone. So basically, ruthenium serves as a mobile species instead of oxygen vacancies in this new device. And this leads to the fantastic switching behavior. Uh, however, why ruthenium can do this? Um, it's still something need further study. Um, this is one example, some fundamental in situ um, study and the, with high resolution um, is needed, high resolution spatial and the temporal resolution is needed to really visualize the entire process. Okay, so um, remember the third requirement uh, in order to build a large scale FPA is to have uh, many, many resistance levels. Uh, for example, you can have uh, um, you can switch the device uh, with thousands of levels. Then one device can be used as uh, uh, to to uh, replace uh, uh, hundreds, thousands of capacitors for a filter. And for a neural network, you also want to have uh, uh, many resistance levels. Also, RM device uh, has a large on ratio typically, but it's not quite a resistor. When you switch the device freshly to a certain resistance state, you give it a small voltage, constant voltage, you monitor the current and you can see large fluctuation. So the resistance level has a large random telegraph noise. Such large fluctuation prevent you from getting many resistance levels that are distinguishable, even if uh, the on ratio is large. So, we manage to actually uh, understand what's going on with the noise and develop a protocol to denoise the device. And after denoising, you can see the resistance level become very stable. And then you can have a, a neighboring resistance levels are very close to each other and still distinguishable. Um, so with that, we managed to get um, over 2048 resistance levels, which is equivalent to 11 bit. Um, in the device, they are actually fabricated in the fab. Okay, so this is not just for the oxide material we use, um, half near oxide. It actually is quite general to, uh, to other oxide. For tantalum oxide, you can see before denoising, large noise, after denoising, it become very stable. And uh, many cases, when you see noise from your device like this, it doesn't look like a RTN. Um, but in fact, the noise are usually RTN. Um, if you use a high sampling rate, you can get uh, um, the, the noise, the same noise remarried at high speed, high sampling rate. You can see actually the RTN feature start to show up. And so it is the RTN give us the trouble and the denoise can remove the RTN and 
then the question is, uh, what's the mechanism of the denoise? And we use a uh, conducting AFM and to help us understand this, the conducting AFM can visualize the conduction channel in the device before denoise and after denoise. For example, before denoise, um, the device is switched to a fresh state and we use scanning, um, uh, uh, conducting AFM. Um, to look at it, we find that there is a major conduction channel and next to it, there is an island. And um, this is relatively more resistive. Um, and uh, the total device shows noise, big noise. And then we use a voltage that is smaller than its switching threshold voltage, but larger than the normal reading voltage um, to denoise it. In this case, we use the voltage polarity that normally would switch the device off, but with a relatively small voltage, we apply to the device, it can be denoised. And as you can see, after denoising, um, the blue curve shows uh, stable switching behavior, stable resistance levels, and the conducting AFM shows that this island is down. So for other devices, um, like before denoising, you can see here is a major conduction channel, but uh, next to it, it is uh, uh, a region that is relatively uh, more resistive, but uh, it is an incomplete channel. Next to it, we call this case a bay uh, case. And uh, then we can also denoise it. We can use a, a voltage that uh, uh, is a polarity, normally would switch the device on. And after applying that small voltage, we can see the noise is gone at the blue curve and um, the conducting AFM shows uh, this part become more uh, complete. So basically this island and this bay, they are incomplete channels. They are more relatively more resistive than the complete channel, com complete uh, conduction channel. And so the more resistive uh, uh, channel are actually less doped with oxygen vacancies. So we call this incomplete channel with uh, relatively less oxygen vacancy dopant. And it seems they are related to the RTN noise, okay? So we further use a, a theoretical simulation to understand um, why such incomplete channel can give us the, the RTN noise um, in the island case and the bay case. Let's just look at the island case. This is a, a incomplete channel. And it turned out that uh, uh, this incomplete channel can be sensitive to a charge trapped nearby. So without a charge trap nearby, the conduction of this channel is the blue curve. It shows a, a reasonable conduct, conduction. And with a, a charge trap nearby to this incomplete channel, you can see depending on the dopant level in the channel, if you have a, a more oxygen vacancy, like this one, then the channel can be partially blocked with the low resistance. But if you have a low, relatively lower oxygen vacancy open in the channel, it can be fully blocked by this charge. And so this charge can come and go. That's why it, this channel get blocked and unblocked, give us the RT noise. So in order to remove such noise, naturally, we want to get rid of the incomplete channel. And you can get rid of the incomplete channel by completely remove it, um, you know, by remove all the oxygen vacancies. Um, so you can denoise it that way. You can also get rid of an incomplete channel by making it complete. In that way, you put more oxygen vacancies in it, so the channel is less sensitive to a trap nearby. So that's the denoise uh, mechanism. Um, but of course, uh, another way to get rid of the noise is to get rid of the trap centers. Uh, it turned out to be harder to get rid of the trap centers. So in this case, the trap centers are oxygen um, interstitial. And how can you get oxygen interstitial in the oxide like hafnium oxide? 
So the as prepared film is a stoichiometric hafnium dioxide. And um, how can you get it some uh, hux, uh, two plus X, two plus delta, extra octane uh, in near uh, the channel? So it is easy to understand. In fact, uh, you know, the device always need a electrical forming process, which is a process you apply electrical field to quickly remove uh, some oxygen from the dioxide and uh, get oxygen vacancies in the channel. And then you need to put oxygen somewhere. Some of the extra oxygen will go out of the device being released, but this process is so fast, not all the oxygen can go out. Actually, many of them get pushed away to the side and stay inside of the dioxide and the oxygen going here get become interstitial. And then inside of the center, you have oxygen vacancies. Both can be um, electron traps, but oxygen vacancies are a faster trap with nanosecond uh, on time scale. It won't um, affect our um, electrical operation. And such interstitial um, prep center can have a millisecond um, prep lifetime so that it can in fact give us the telegraph noise. In fact, this has been observed um, in Tantalmark said, and in this experiment, we have uh, the as prepared film is a suboxide. And then when you electrically form it, you create even more oxygen vacancies in the channel, conduction channel but that process actually get push some oxygen to its neighbor. And we find that in the neighbor, actually there uh, is a uh, uh, tantalum pentaoxide. Um, so basically this oxygen get pushed away to uh, mix the suboxide into a stoichiometric oxide. This can also be seen by yields and other data. Okay, so to summarize the, the mechanism of the denoise, basically for every uh, RM switch, memristive switch, you give it a voltage pulse and uh, you have the conduction channel start to grow, all the filament start to grow. The one grow earlier uh, will have the time to be mature and uh, to be complete. The one grow later will not finish at the end of the Pulse and those end up with uh, uh, being an incomplete channel and with uh, less oxygen vacancies in it. And it is more sensitive to charge trap nearby. And those are the trouble um, site, give us the noise. And fortunately, those are also met stable phase and they can be removed by using a relatively small voltage, smaller than the threshold voltage to switch the device. And you can use such small, relatively small voltage to denoise it by removing those. And then this is a denoise process. And if you want to switch the device to a more, more resistive state, you can just uh, use a voltage that over the threshold, then the, um, the channel or the film becomes smaller and smaller during the switching. So that's the denoise and switching process, which can be fully reproduced by simulation shown here. Okay, to summarize, um, uh, I hope I conveyed the message that uh, FPAA um, may play a great boost to the analog circuit, very important for the future analog computing. And uh, such FPAA have been demonstrated with memristors um, in it playing three major roles as a routing network and the analog component and also neural network. Um, so we also uh, reviewed the origin of uh, the RTN noise um, that had, have been preventing us from getting a lot of uh, conductance levels. And we um, designed a protocol to eliminate such um, uh, RTN noise and uh, obtained uh, thousands of conductance levels, which is the highest, uh, uh, I believe, ever reported in any type of memory. Um, so we also demonstrated a fully integrated chip um, with the 256 by, by 256 arrays um, integrated on a CMOS driving circuit um, made in the standard fan. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank my um, 
students who are working on the project and also my collaborators um, from different places and especially um, the collaborators from Adan National Lab for working on the Zinium project. And also like to thank my um, sponsors um, and thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, thanks, Joshua. It's very, very, very exciting talk. And so, you know, especially the last part of the fundamental for the denoise. Uh, yeah, that's a very interesting stuff. Yeah, as any question, you know, you can just uh, open your mic, you know, speak up or or you can raise your hands and uh, or put a question in chat. Yeah, let's just uh, put a flop. Yeah. <laughs> Any question? Or maybe I can, uh, yeah, I can ask a question. So uh, one is a little bit general and then I ask a little specific. So more general thing is uh, you're thinking because uh, like the crossbar, it sounds like uh, 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 the array will become like, a, you know, bigger and bigger. So my question is, uh, so in a crossbar, if some node, they have a fa you know failure or something wrong with one of the node or one selected the node, how they're gonna affect the overall, you know, behavior or performance, or whether that can be quickly characterized or quickly diagnosed and know about it, and how to fix them or how to correct them. Do, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, so um, a very good question. It depends on um, how bad this uh, um, defect and uh, how the nature of the defect. If the defect, for example, if it is, uh, just a, a device that cannot be programmed accurately, um, mm -hmm. it is less a problem for neural network because uh, neural network, you are not just reading individual device to determine yeah. you get an error or not. Instead, you read the entire array or at least a column um, to decide what's the total result, right? And um, so in that case, you can always over-program your neighboring device to compensate that bad guy that is not, uh, um, you know, cannot be accurately programmed. So, but there are um, other defects that is uh, um, the device is stuck on, for example, it cannot be programmed, but it's a current sync. That's the worst case. In this case, um, you have to um, rely on some of the access device, such as in the 1T1R array, you have an access device is a transistor and you can just, um, in your algorithm, you um, you do not use this uh, uh, this row or this column with a uh, current sync, and so in this way you can uh, avoid that. Uh, but uh, of course, um, uh, it's better to have the device stuck in the high resistance state instead of stuck in the low resistance state as a current sync. So for the device start as a high resistance state, you can probably just ignore it. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that. So, so the se second question is uh, back to the the more fundamental research for the denoise. Yeah, it sounds like a very interesting. So, uh, well, you 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 pr present two examples. One is a hafenic oxide, another is a tantalic oxide. So, so you, you, your TEM really showing that when when one region have a more defect, they push those oxygen go to a nearby region. That region actually become more fully oxidized, right? I mean, you know. Yeah. You know, Right. Yeah, that's. But but I, I know maybe tantalic oxide is a slightly, but I know hafenic oxide uh, they have a multi you know structure phase. So I'm wondering you know when there's a uh, oxygen vacancy from less from like uh, this deficiency to on you know over, on you know over, over you know a, a, you know uh, stoichiometry are they gonna also change in the phase of the of the material system or this is just total morphous so we don't worry about the structure phase effect. Or uh, yeah, they, they can change the phase depending on how much. Yeah, you can, you know, as you know, half the mark said how so the phase model. Yeah, then, bunch, bunch of phase, then, yeah, then, 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 yeah, then the yeah. also rhombic and the tetragonal. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they, they, they can change those um, you know, depending on the, the composition, temperature, everything. And but but this is a in uh, met stable process. It's not thermally stable process, right? So just because it happens so fast and uh, uh... okay, that's interesting. So, uh, so any question from the audience? So uh, I have a question, Josh. 
Yeah. 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 I see for the device in the, 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 the thickness is very small, but the lateral size is so big. Uh, I'm not sure in your device, in, the, in your real like array device, if the lateral size is still like uh, hundreds of times as the thickness. I'm wonder uh, well, why you you the lateral size you keep that big or is should we make the lateral size way smaller for the applications? Yeah. Yes. Yes. That, that's a very good question. Yeah. Usually it, it's a disk, right, rather than filament, mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. uh, um, so. Yeah, we we would like to make this smaller, and uh, um, so this, in fact, a smaller device could uh, have a, a lot of better behavior. And we have uh, demonstrated a, a device as small as two nanometer by two nanometer, and we even made it in the crossbar array. Oh. Um, so the device can be scaled down to their scale. Um, for the device I'm showing here. It's limited by the foundry technology. Oh, no, okay. Yeah, yeah. And we would like to make it much smaller, okay. and uh, the resistance will be higher, and uh, there will, there will are be other good property. Mm -hmm. Great. So, uh, if no more questions. Let's uh, sex with Joshua again. So let's uh, applaud. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> We're gonna hear the noise, you know, from the plug. So yeah, thanks, Josh. But it's very, yeah. it's very exciting, you know, talk. You know, it's uh, yeah. I remember I, I read this a new nature paper. It's pretty yeah. amazing, you know. <laughs> it's a very amazing paper. So yeah, for this uh, your things. Okay, so thank you. So thanks, Joshua. And then let's move on our next uh, invited speaker. So uh, yeah, Sharon, I think you are online. You know, you can maybe open your mic and then. Oh, sure, I'm here. Where is hey, well, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. I don't. I cannot okay. see your camera. Where is your camera? Uh, hold on, I'm just. Uh... <laughs> oh, right, okay, okay, got it, got can it. Can you see, see? And I just shared my screen. Oh, okay, good, good. So, okay, so, uh, yeah, let me also introduce. So, our next uh, speaker is a uh, Professor Sharon Reminasen from uh, Radicus University. So, before you know his talk, I want to give also short, you know, uh, you know, introduction. So Professor Sharan Ram is right now is a full professor in the Department of Electric, uh, Electric and Computer Engineer in Radicus. And then he also the first holder for this Radic uh, 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 a uh, chair in engineering in Radicus. Uh, Sharan got his uh, PhD in material science engineering from Stanford 2002. And then he was uh, uh, working in this industry, Intel, as a research staff member for about three years before he, he, uh, he joined Harvard. He is serving Harvard apply uh, physical faculty, you know, for almost like nine or ten years, and then he was a full professor at the department, uh, I think, materials uh, engineer or material science in Purdue for uh, before he joined Radagers in 2022, just last year, and then his research actually uh, interest focused on uh, metal stable semiconductor device for uh, special device physics for artificial intelligence, robotic, and uh, brain machine interface. And 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 that of material and devices. So uh, you know, Shrine's group is very active. He has, you know, his research team already published more than two hundred peer, uh, peer paper in uh, you know major research you know article and in, in, in this field. Uh, his team also as a our longtime user at the uh, DOE facility, including APS, Nano Center, and also NSS two. So okay, Shran, please. Start your talk. Right, thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you for the very uh, generous introduction. Uh, yeah, so I'll talk a little bit about our work on uh, uh, oxide materials, oxide semiconductors. Uh, and I want to thank all the collaborators and friends at Argon uh, for, uh, you know, uh, lots and lots of discussions and uh, collaborations and and uh, joint articles and so forth. So thank you very much. Uh, and it's wonderful to work with Argonne colleagues and also use the facilities and, and participate in these uh, workshops. Okay, uh, so the main question I want to talk about is uh, related to neuromorphic computing, AI, uh, these type of related topics. Uh, so I'll focus a little bit more on neuroscience and then focus a little bit more on what uh, materials physics can contribute or potentially contribute in this, in this, in this area. So the main question is uh, what uh, Eric Kandel and co-authors asked almost uh, 30, 50 years back, 
you know, what is the basic alphabet for simple forms of learning? You know, so this is a question posed entirely to the neuroscience community. Uh, are there uh, fundamental mechanisms that can uh, universally be applied for different forms of learning, meaning uh, uh, non-associative learning, associative learning, uh, and, uh, and sort of derivatives of that? So a lot of these studies focused on the California sea slug as a model system, uh, which is uh, aplesia. And so you can see here, this is habituation, sensitization. These are two uh, non-associative forms of learning. And then classical conditioning is an example of associative learning. Uh, and, uh, you know, we can ask the same question or somewhat similar in, in synthetic matter. Are there uh, fundamental building blocks that can be used to uh, emulate uh, intelligence and contribute to AI hardware. So that's the main question. And then there are a number of different research directions that one can pursue, uh, you know, uh, in terms of basic research. Uh, and we want to define it very broadly because neuromorphic computing, uh, some aspects have been around for many decades and some aspects are emerging and uh, some aspects, you know, yet to be discovered, you know, in fact, you know, sort of depends on what the problems are in the coming decades. So some examples here, so you can see evolutionary dynamics. This is one of my favorite examples. Uh, these are brood parasites that uh, model their eggs uh, after the host eggs. And so this is a you know, fantastic example of evolutionary adaptation. Uh, and so the, these type of uh, uh, problems are related to what's called the evolutionary arms race, where the host birds try to continuously improve identification of their eggs compared to the parasite eggs, and then the parasites continuously try to improve, you know, uh, laying eggs that would mimic the host egg. So there's sort of a continuous interaction going on. Um, and then there's a lot of interesting research in the idea, of, you know, utilizing ideas of uh, echoes, which is basically using metastable matter for computing. The Perhaps the most famous example is uh, uh, using water as a computer, just to show that uh, you don't even need a you know, very traditional uh, semiconductor to, to demonstrate computing it just uses uh, sort of short-term memory in water for computing. So these are some very creative examples just to think very broadly about information. And then uh, there's a number of research activities going on in, in both in neuroscience and psychology in the context of learning. You know, how can we learn? Uh, why do we learn? Or I mean, uh, how do we continue to learn throughout our life? There's lots of interesting questions. Uh, and then what is the role of forgetting in learning? And can you learn without forgetting? Can you learn better with forgetting? Uh, these type of basic questions. So the, some of the fundamental exam, uh, studies here are done uh, using what's called interval training. So I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then there is, you know, again, information processing broadly defined, the sort of intelligence that being distributed across, across, uh, across an organism, for example, not just the brain, but also you know how do you distribute intelligence outside outside a particular organ, uh, and then you can. There's lots of interesting questions here, and then of course there is a subset here. We want to contribute to sort of emerging uh, emerging uh, beyond silicon, you know, 3D CMOS integration. You can discover semiconductors, electronics that can be processed, you know, below 500, 600 C. Then you can sort of make an argument that they could be compatible with. Uh, back end of line integration, things like that. So there's lots of different opportunities here, uh, and some of it could even be useful for uh, chip scale uh, in, in integration in the future. So I wanna focus on just one topic today, which is uh, strongly correlated semiconductors. Uh, why are they interesting? Because uh, one reason is you can change the conductance of these systems by external stimuli. So if you compare and contrast uh, cartoons of band diagrams of uh, you know, traditional semiconductors versus, versus correlated semiconductors. You can see here, uh, you know, traditional transistors or any of these semiconductors that we are familiar with, uh, the, the material remains a semiconductor throughout the operation. What you're doing is varying the position of the Fermi level with respect to the band edges by external stimulus like an electric field. In correlated semiconductors, you can change the band gap effectively, or in other words, take a metal, convert it into an insulator or a semiconductor. And in some cases, you can even sort of gradually do this change or you can sort of realize a range of band gaps. Um, and you can go, go back and forth reversibly. 
And so you have a phase transition at a particular critical stimulus, could be a threshold voltage, and uh, this is the basic mechanism. So you're reconstructing the band structure here, and you are also simultaneously changing, in many cases, the optical properties as you go through this transition, and also magnetic properties. And so there's really uh, many interesting questions here in terms of how these happen, and also uh, questions, many, many questions or sort of uh, opportunities for discovery here to study these materials as semiconductors. So practically, you know, very, very little is known uh, as, uh, you know, for their properties. So, you know, thousands of papers exist on correlated systems, but, you know, mostly they are sort of, you know, synthesis, X-ray spectroscopy, or some sort of electronic structure calculations. But if you ask even very simple questions, like, you know, what is the dielectric constant, you know, there's from thousands, there will be two or three papers, you know, in the best case scenario. So it's really wonderful opportunity for basic research to extend the reach of these quantum materials as semiconductors, materials that could potentially impact microelectronics in the coming years. So, you know, you need compelling properties to do their basic research. And here is one example. Why do we want to study these materials? Well, uh, you know, the basic idea of neuromorphic computing has not changed over the past several decades. You know, you can see this is a paper, I um, mean, you know, a sentence I took out of Carver Meade's paper from almost uh, 25 years or even more. Uh, you can see in neuromorphic systems, you know, you want to enlarge our vocabulary of computational primitives uh, to help sort of improve understanding computation in our systems. And this is, you know, uh, largely true even today. We want to sort of continue thinking about how neuroscience can inspire new ways of information processing. And so these are some examples of uh, early demonstrations of silicon-based neuromorphic chips. And you can see there's fairly complicated circuits that are needed even for what you might consider fundamental elementary demonstration of, of a single neuron or a single learning mechanism uh, by including correlated oxides or incorporating correlated oxides in simple circuits, you could largely simplify these type of circuits. So you can have, this is some work we did with Argon collaborators, Dr. Guha and coworkers some years back. So you can see a, a VO2 uh, phase transition material coupled with the capacitor can emulate a neuron uh, sort of approaching the simplicity of the first neuron model proposed uh, well over 100 years back. And so uh, the main idea here is uh, you take a material that has rich internal physics and internal dynamics and see to what extent uh, the circuit level complexity can be simplified to the single material or device level complexity. So that's the main opportunity here. So I'll give you a few examples uh, or a few different materials I'll go through uh, in terms of what, what, what kind of properties one can see and what the basic research challenges are. So first I'll start with symmetry breaking on charge filling. So you can see here, this is VO2, it's a very famous material studied for many decades. Uh, it has a metal insulator transition near room temperature, and we are continuously discovering what opportunities this opens up. Uh, uh, so there's really absolutely wonderful material. Uh, one of the early demonstrations is uh, artificial neurons. And so this can be done by coupling VO2 with the capacitor. As the material goes through an electrically driven phase transition, the conductance of the device changes. And so whenever it goes through a metallic state, let's say you can have current spikes and the uh, material can be cooled down as, it, as the voltage stimulus, for example, is removed. And so the dynamics of cooling allows you to build in a refractory period. So there is sort of this periodic spiking that happens that very beautifully emulates uh, neuronal firing in the brain. Now, this is for a pristine or a nearly stoichiometric material. You can also introduce defects in these compounds. So for example, you can see oxygen vacancies. Uh, if you introduce oxygen vacancies, they can sort of gradually metallize the film by donating electrons to the vanadium orbitals. And so you can see here, uh, uh, you can sort of uh, uh, reduce the ground state resistance from uh, nominal insulating state all the way to fully metallic state. So you can very carefully control the insulating state resistance, the phase transition threshold temperature, or effectively the voltage, and also the on-off ratio. So there are many different parameters that can simultaneously be controlled. And also, very interestingly, you can also control the uh, volatility, or in other words, non-volatility. So if you introduce charge defects, 
you can introduce volatility. Whereas if you have pristine compound, then you have what's called a threshold switch where you have uh, basically hysteresis or short-term memory. So these are some uh, very diverse set of properties that can be obtained with the same material by controlling the crystal chemistry. Now, if you look at NiO, nickel oxide, it's another uh, uh, sort of uh, well-known mod insulator. Here, the band structure is slightly different. You have basically, it's called a charge transfer insulator. So you can have, uh, you can have excess oxygen that provides whole type conduction. And if you can uh, create metastable defects here, then you can have some really interesting behavior. So this is one example. So this is a experiment done at about uh, 500 Kelvin in a furnace. What we are doing here is taking nickel oxide, a simple uh, thin film on a substrate like sapphire, we expose it to hydrogen gas, and then you change the resistance. So the resistance increases because the material is reducing. You're basically creating more of nickel 2 plus, which is close to the mod insulating state. Now, if you introduce air, that is, if you stop flowing hydrogen, the resistance will drop back slowly to the original value. And if you don't let it quite relax back to the original value, but you can sort of go back and forth, uh, do the same exposure, you're basically training the material or interval training. And you can sort of create an out of equilibrium scenario here and you know, demonstrate something called learning or habituation. So you have a same stimulus that is being presented, but the response is gradually decreasing. You can also sensitize this material by introducing a chemical or an optical stimulus. And then if you remove the stimulus for a very extended period of time, you can uh, completely forget the stimulus existed. So this is a replication study of an experiment done by Eric Kandel uh, about 50, 55 years back on the sea slug. And so this is just to show that these type of synthetic materials could potentially be platforms for investigating learning mechanisms. And so this is in a furnace, you know, with chemically modulating. And so you can ask, hey, is it possible to do this in a device, uh, you know, in a more or less standard uh, electrical stimulus, you can. Uh, so if you have uh, metastable defects, you could. So you can see here, this is entirely electrical stimulus and this is sensitization at a higher voltage. So you can basically translate defect physics or defect chemistry from a furnace at high temperature to a room temperature, all electric, uh, uh, all electric device. So this is sort of very interesting how you can go from uh, bulk defects or defects formed from the surface through the thickness to sort of or most likely filamentary type defects within a device. So all of this is done by sort of reorganizing the defect related um, uh, defect related bands in the in the material. Um, so this is the metastability here. So you can see this is nickel oxide. Again, the same experiment I showed before, except if you do the same experiment of relaxation in the different environments very carefully over many orders of magnitude of the ground state conductivity. So you can synthesize the oxide with different initial conductivity by controlling the defect density. And then you can repeat the same experiment of exposing to, at different temperatures, uh, different environments. Uh, you can build a relaxation time plot versus conductivity. And why is this interesting? This is interesting because this is very similar to electron glass behavior uh, done on disordered insulators, in this case at about four Kelvin. So this is uh, sort of uh, relaxation behavior as a function of conductivity. And this is very similar experiment done at you know, almost 400, 500 Kelvin higher temperature on nickel oxide, uh, but you can see very similar sort of uh, relaxation dynamics. So what this tells you is that the relaxation time scales can be controlled by controlling the ground state conductivity, which is very important because then this allows you to do more experiments on learning and forgetting. So this is one example. So the dynamics of the uh, learning and forgetting can be used to emulate a very famous experiment uh, done by, uh, I mean, known as Ebbinghaus learning or Ebbinghaus forgetting. And so this is done by, this is very commonly studied by psychologists in terms of how humans learn information, how much information you can store, how much you can you know, forget, uh, things like that. So this is basically probability of recall versus uh, time interval between presenting information. And this is, you know, a sort of experiment done on nickel oxide where you can see sort of similar behavior. Um, you can also emulate lower level organisms. So this is Stentor, which is a sim simple si single cellular organism where people have studied uh, learning and forgetting. And you can sort of 
may make similar you know, sort of uh, uh, results as a function of training. So the main mechanism here that enables these type of emulation is defects that are metastable. So they can spontaneously relax back uh, when the stimulus is removed. So this doesn't happen for all nickel oxide, by the way. So this only happens, you know, like in this plot, you see here that the time scales are very sensitive to the initial conductivity or the non stoichiometry uh, So we don't fully understand this for sure. We don't fully understand this, uh, you know, in terms of why certain types of defects or certain types of defect concentrations relax in a certain way. But I think this is a really important question to address in the future. You know, and, and if there are techniques at Argon that allow us to interrogate this, I think it will be very, very valuable. So uh, these are individual device level measurements or material level measurements. Uh, you could, in principle, uh, extend this to uh, through simulations or through sort of networks. You can sort of extend it to how information can be processed, uh, you know, in, in networks. So this is, these are experiments done, you know, for example, and by psychologists who take experiments done from individuals or groups of individuals, and then sort of look at build models for information processing. Similarly, neuroscientists do similar experiments, take material data from single, single uh, uh, animals or you know, organisms, and then predict how information can be processed in, in a colony. So these are sort of, you know, uh, so you could, in principle, what we do with collaborators is take these type of device level data and then we have collaborators who sort of implement these in neural networks to look at how networks learn uh, information in under tight constraints of memory. So that's sort of the connection to uh, neuromorph. That's one connection to neuromorphic computing and neural networks. Uh, you can also look at other uh, examples of correlated semiconductors. Now I'm slowly getting to the uh, strongly correlated part. First, I showed you, uh, you know, sort of a insulated to a semiconductor transition or insulated to metal transition. Now we're going the other way. Uh, so this is uh, a perovskite nicolate, RNIO3. R can be, uh, for example, neodymium, samarium, uh, uh, any of these sort of uh, rare earths. So you can introduce correlation by a few different techniques. Uh, you can, for example, create oxygen defects. And this is a most fascinating property of this class of materials is that when you introduce oxygen defects, you make the material more insulating. So this is almost exactly the opposite of what happens in most oxide systems, where the charge carriers due to oxygen defects will go into the conduction band. Here you can have uh, localization of carriers. Uh, in addition, you know, if you're interested in exploring the electronic effects of defects, uh, beyond the dilute levels, you can actually have uh, uh, you can reconstruct the crystal field splitting by introducing extensive defects. So you can go from perovskite to sort of other phases, derivative phases, you know, brown millerite is one example. So you can sort of have even structural uh, distortions and reconstructions in addition to electronic reconstructions. So you can create a range of metastable compounds and you could in principle go between two structures or just explore the properties of intermediate metastable phases. So if you have pristine compound versus oxygen defects, you could simply move oxygen defects around and create different types of synaptic uh, plasticity within the same structure. Or you could go between two structures, uh, what's called topotactic transformations, and you can create different kinds of conductance states. So it's really you know, anywhere between sort of proof of concept, fundamental understanding to impressive uh, device level demonstration, depending on the interest uh, you know, of the uh, any different opportunities here. And then finally, I want to show one example that we have studied for a number of years now, which is metal to insulator transition. Uh, this is uh, one of the, uh, you know, sort of, I think I would say at this point, most uh, uh, interesting example of a phase transition independent of temperature, where you can have nearly infinite change in conductivity. And this happens by uh, electron doping. So if you start with the electronic configuration of a nicolate, which has one EG uh, uh, electron. And then if you add one more electron from an electron donor like hydrogen, you can have what's called half filling. And then this results in a uh, massive phase transition. So you can see this is conducting AFM of a pristine compound. When you add electrons, uh, it, it becomes nearly fully insulating. So you have this nearly 10 power eight, 10 power 10 orders of magnitude change in conductivity uh, arising from electron doping. And this is uh, independent of temperature. And you can also control this by electric fields or external stimuli because uh, the electron is, I'm sorry, the hydrogen is charged 
And so it responds to electric fields. So the physics of this is related to the uh, doping mechanisms. So we are very familiar with traditional gate dielectrics uh, for band semiconductors like silicon. And this is my first slide I showed, you know, basically you're moving the position of the Fermi level with respect to the band edges. Then you have typical electric field effects. You could extend this by maybe an order of magnitude with just the right semiconductor using electric double layers. And then if you, if, if this is not a good system for using electric double layers because of chemical stability, then we can literally exceed this all the way to lattice stability limit by ion doping. So this is what we are doing in these cases where we are introducing dopants of the order of one carrier per unit cell. At this level, you can completely reconstruct the bands and discover new phases that you simply did not know existed before. So, so between pristine nicolate and this phase here, the only way to discover this is by adding electrons at this level, right? So this summarizes about 10 years of research in our group. Uh, this is electrostatic uh, doping or electrostatic transistors with, with ionic liquids. So this is the same compound, SMNiO3. And this is uh, ionic gating at the lattice doping limit. So you see here, you, can, you know, if you're strictly within the electrostatic limit, ionic liquids can only modulate conductance of oxides like PO2, nickel H by, you know, between 1 to 10 percent. And then if you go into the, uh, if you exceed the electrostatic limit, then you can get in this case for nickel H, you know, some ridiculous number like 10 trillion fold or something like that. So this, this is what happens. Uh, then, then you can dope electrons uh, at, the, at this limit. So this is really, you know, this is a basic research field. I think, you know, this, 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 can, this can sustain several decades of research in the future because, you know, if you think of, if you go back and look at the silicon uh, literature or even Hafni Moxide, it, you know, it's anywhere between 20 to 25 years of research to develop a good gate insulator for a semiconductor, right? Uh, and so, uh, these gates don't do anything for correlated semiconductors. You really need gates that can introduce charge carriers roughly 100,000 to million four larger than what silicon dioxide and hafnium oxide has done for silicon. And so this is a really very, very interesting, important area of research that deserves a lot of attention in the future. Okay, so this is where argon comes in and we have some absolutely wonderful collaborations over the years. Uh, so so uh, what we have been able to study is adding and removing of these electrons from these compounds very, very systematically. And so we have done this through gas phase, liquid phase, solid state, you know, all kinds of different interfaces to understand electron addition. So this is just one example. So this is, uh, for example, you can see here, this is exactly in the context of neuromorphic computing. So we are applying electric uh, voltage stimulus to this compound, uh, to the nicolate. And then we are watching the electrical resistance change. And then simultaneously, if you do X-ray absorption spectroscopy on these same samples, you can very carefully extract the nickel three plus to two plus ratio uh, as you add and remove electrons or hydrogen in this case. I'm sorry, electrons uh, 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 to, to, to the compound. And so you can watch potentiation depression happen uh, along with the uh, electronic structure change and you can quantify this, and then you can also do simultaneously, you can do things like conducting AFM. So you can see here, this is a mostly conducting, this is fully doped, and then this is partially doped. You can see sort of the electronic granularity that evolves. And in the long term, what we want to do is understand the granularity to the global electrical resistance evolution. So that'll be fascinating. And so this is one of the early experiments we did with Dr. Huazao many, many years back now, where we are looking at uh, uh, high temperature gas phase doping of these compounds. And so you can see this uh, proof of concept showing that we could actually track the electron doping. And then we were able to do uh, over the years more careful in situ measurements. So this is this is really uh, you know very exciting for us to be able to understand or try to understand the microscopic mechanisms that allow uh, that allow the uh, change in conductivity, change in electronic structure and so forth. So, so far I showed some proof of concept. You can extend this to sort of, you know, try to extend this to cutting edge memory technologies or cutting edge neuromorphic computing. So there you need to show things like, you know, small devices, high speed, you know, power. I mean, all the usual, usual sort of metrics start to come into play. And I think we have been able to demonstrate, uh, you know, these are indeed interesting at that, at that level. 
So, you, so because you are working with protons, which is basically next to the electron, it's the lightest or the smallest dopant perhaps. And so we are uh, able to move these very fast, get, get responses down to nanosecond time scales. Uh, and also you can fabricate these structures by lithography uh, fairly carefully. And, and so you can, you can sort of uh, work with all solid state devices. And for those of you who are interested in the nicolates in particular, uh, you know, the, this phase transition actually happens in lanthanum nicolate too. So this is something we showed last year. Lanthanum nicolate is sort of an anomalous compound among the family of uh, rare earth nicolates because it doesn't show a thermal phase transition. But then we showed that this physics of the electron doping transition is actually common universal across the nicolates. So even for LNaO3, the three plus to two plus, or at least the simplistic interpretation of the electron addition to the nickel manifold is uh, is sort of manifest in the same way. You can see this metal to massive metal to insulator phase transition in LNaO3. And so this is actually interesting and important for practical applications. And the reason for that is some of the rare earths require supremely high oxygen pressures. Uh, so our early work, 10, 12 years back when we started working on this, you know, we, we were uh, using ultra high pressures to synthesize the samarium nicolates. And then slowly we transitioned to neodymium nicolate uh, because you don't need uh, super high pressures. And then more recently we are exploring lanthanum nicolate. So basically the choice of material opens up the ease of deposition techniques, uh, you know, so, you know, becomes a little uh, le uh, less constraints. And more recently, we even showed that you can grow these materials by atomic layer deposition, which is now a, you know, very important technique for uh, mainstream semiconductors. So you can sort of expand the reach of, you know, these exotic materials into semiconductor systems, uh, semiconductor platforms. And also, I don't have data here to show, but you know, the, we, have, we have shown that, I don't mean, sorry, I, I have the data, I've not put it on these slides, is we can extend the electron doping strategy from protons to other elements like uh, sodium, lithium, magnesium, so forth. So in other words, you can sort of slowly work towards voltage-gated ion channel analogies that are uh, from, from standard neuroscience uh, studies. So this is my last slide, I think. Uh, uh, these are many examples over the years uh, of using nicolates to emulate different types of learning and uh, studies uh, from, from neuroscience and psychology. So this is one of the early works showing plasticity uh, using nicolates. And then this is uh, non-associative learning. Uh, this is an example of uh, ultrametric trees, which is a hierarchical memory structure in the brain, uh, sort of noted in most brains. And then more recently, We've been studying uh, probabilistic uh, uh, spiking. Probabilistic computing is uh, turning out to be an important area and developing hardware for that is uh, very, very early stages. So we, we are very excited by the opportunities pro protons present in, in these systems to emulate some of, these, uh, some of these properties. And so this is the vision for microelectronics or one vision we have for microelectronics. So if you are familiar with uh, traditional transistors, you can see the, you know, the big sort of leap happened some years back. Silicon, silicon dioxide, polysilicon was replaced with silicon high K metal gates. And so this is considered a revolutionary change. And I think we can you know, sort of envision the next revolutionary change here, which is quite compatible with silicon actually. Uh, we want to basically extend the concept of this high K not just to sustain electric field and high capacitance, but actually high K as an ion reservoir. So you need minimal modifications uh, here. Uh, conceptually, practically it's a different matter, but you know, in terms of conceptually, the high K could serve as an ion reservoir and uh, enable all these different wonderful properties that I just showed that uh, is possible by not just sustaining an electric field, but to use the electric field to move charges uh, or electrons uh, in massive numbers that, uh, that are required for these types of correlated semiconductors, orders of magnitude more than what is sufficient for silicon or germanium. So this is the, I think this is a really interesting research direction. We need to understand lots of things about this. We are just starting to scratch the surface. So uh, just a few examples. Uh, we completely 
you know, I mean, I think we poorly understand the origin of metastability. I know, at least for the nickel oxide example I showed, uh, you know, not much is uh, known. And I'm sure this type of behavior is found in many other systems. So really understanding metastable defects uh, is, 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 a, is going to be an important area. Uh, electronic granularity is, of course, important because we are looking at the uh, macroscopic resistance, which is you know, driven by microscopic electronic structure changes. So we need to have a sort of a length scale, a multi multi length scale understanding of electronic transport. And you know, I think Dr. Guha also mentioned this earlier in his presentation. Uh, I think you know, regardless of the specific materials that are being discussed, uh, I really think we need to have a sort of basic research and understanding. Uh, physics of dopant action and diffusion dynamics in, in many of these systems. I think this is a great research uh, opportunity. And I want to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please let me know. Yeah, thanks, yeah, Shran. Thank it's a very exciting talk. So, yeah, I, yeah, go ahead. Do you have any questions? So. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, good, good to see you. And <laughs> hey. uh, th thank you for uh, the wonderful talk. Um, sure. Yeah. I, I have two uh, questions. One is, uh, um, you know, you have been working with the proton as a mobile species, and then you mentioned uh, other types, lithium, uh, magnesium, sodium. Can you compare the two, um, you know, with the advantage, disadvantage, why you want to look at one or the other? Yes, uh, it's a great question. So we we looked at, uh, you know, if, uh, we, looked at hydrogen initially because we, we had some very simple techniques to introduce the dopant uh, using using uh, electrodes from the gas phase. So that was how we got started on this uh, because we were we were working on these uh, ionic liquid gates and things like that for a half neem oxide and all these different gates for many years. And then we were we wanted to increase the charge carrier density. So that's how we got into this. Uh, but then we wanted to understand whether uh, hydrogen was the reason for phase transition or it's the electron. Uh, at that time, we didn't know this. And so we switched from, or we sort of expanded from hydrogen to lithium. So this, this figure you see here is actually lithium, uh, lithium introduction. Uh, the physics is very similar. So what we found was when we added lithium or uh, sodium, the phase transition was very, very similar. Uh, the strain is different. So lithium, for example, the ionic radius is larger than proton. So you can actually have a larger strain when you introduce lithium versus uh, protons. So similarly for sodium, for example. Um, in terms of practical uh, application-driven uh, uh, you know, differences, uh, we found that lithium, for example, is uh, very picky in terms of the electrodes that you can use for introducing lithium. Mm -hmm. Similarly for sodium, many of these experiments we actually did using liquids because we wanted to just show the proof of concept. Mm -hmm. uh, for lithium, we use lithium cobalt oxide, uh, but still, you know, I mean, you need to use some sort of polymer gate on top of that, things like that. So the, in terms of the overall stack structure, it, it's more complicated, I think, based on the experiments we did for lithium and sodium and magnesium. Uh, for hydrogen, we have found there are many more approaches. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if 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 uh, if we can introduce ions like lithium through solid state reservoirs, uh, you may be able to accomplish the same thing. Only only other thing we noticed was the dynamics was much slower. Mm -hmm. We can do protons sort of, yeah, at, at fast high speeds, whereas mm -hmm. right. some of these other ions, especially if you're introducing from liquids, they are uh, much slower. Okay, so um, you uh, you need to protect it very well if you deal with the proton, right? Otherwise, you know, you expose it to air, you have water, and uh, yeah. Yeah, so we have we have done a lot of our work on exposed uh, surfaces, in part because we also try to do spectroscopy on the same samples. Mm -hmm. uh, so so we find that having the exposed surface is very useful. So these samples are exceptionally stable at room temperature for months, sometimes even over a year, because we have to wait for beam time and things like that. So, so at room temperature, even a fully exposed sample, there is no problem. Uh, but if you want to heat it up, for example, then it helps to have like a silicon dioxide passivation layer on top. 
So uh, another quick question is similar. You know, you uh, have a short nickel oxide and uh, nucleates, um, so they have similar property. Why? Uh, what's the advantage of using those perovskite uh, nucleates? So in the nickel oxide, everything is through oxygen vacancies. So here, mm -hmm. for example, everything I showed here in the nickel oxide, uh, this this is basically full doping through oxygen interstitials and vacancies. I'm sorry, to, through interstitials and then removing them through hydrogen annealing. Mm -hmm. uh, the resistance change here is minimal from hydrogen. It is entirely through oxygen defects. Uh, sorry, I should have been more clear. So, so basically then, um, uh, you know, here you have metastable oxygen defects, uh, and so you know instead of instead of uh, instead of vacancies, you have interstitials, and then you can have P-type doping. So the mechanisms are slightly different. In nickel oxide, what we found was uh, you can see this plot here: the electric field dynamics. Um, in, at least in the experiments we did, uh, we found that the oxygen dynamics was much slower, a lot of milliseconds and slower. Uh, we could not see any response sort of faster than that. I don't know if that was because we were focusing on metastable defects, uh, but but basically there are some subtle differences like that in terms of the dynamics with nickel oxide versus nickelate. In in the in the the physics of what we are doing here with the nickelates is really right. I mean what we are doing here is we are basically electronically going between a nickelate and the nickel oxide. That's what this this is what electronically is happening. So it's a perovskite. Structure-wise, electronically, it's behaving as a nickel oxide insulator. So that's how we are able to go from a metal to insulator phase transition in in these in, in this particular compound. Whereas if you are already starting with a heavily insulating compound, then you have to go to this type of an argument, where you are basically already starting with the correlated system, but you are changing the strength of the correlation. And so this is a is also possible. So again, here entirely, we can do this with oxygen. What we find is the dynamics are different, but in terms of just near DC type measurements, you can do pretty much the same level of basic research in terms of understanding the physics of what's going on. Cool. Great, thank you. Sure, thank you for the questions. Um, yeah, you, uh, yeah, please go ahead. But you, you should be quick because we wanna follow the schedule. So yeah, go ahead. I understand. So very quick question, Sharon, uh, very nice talk. I want to ask about how important is the crystallinity of these materials? For example, as for silicon, like all these silicon are very, very crystalline, how about nucleus? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question, right? So the beauty of these correlated materials, and I think this is why the, these are truly, I think, you know, they have practical relevance as well, is the function actually is independent of the epitaxy. So this is completely different from you know, the traditional complex oxides that, you know, you might see like superconductors and so forth. So you can have, you know, ultra high performance in polycrystalline uh, oxides uh, that are grown on ITO or, you know, sort of uh, very classical bottom electrodes. So that's one, one thing. Uh, that's one answer. The second is uh, the structure is related to the valence stability. So if you can stabilize the valence, regardless of the epitaxial stabilization of the structure, then the epitaxy simply does not matter because you're electronically modifying the orbital occupancy, right? So that is really the central uh, central mechanisms for resistance modulation. So if you can accomplish that without uh, relying on a substrate, then you can do this. So this is where the high pressure, low pressure, et cetera, come in. So thermodynamically, you can alter the oxygen potential to create the right phase. Thank you. Yeah, yeah Thank great. You Thanks. Thanks, Ren. Thanks uh, all the you know great question discussion. You know, so I don't, Thank I don't you for know the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. In, in, in the very end, we maybe have a few more minutes. If any question, you know, <laughs> you know we can discuss more. But hopefully, Sharan still maybe stay around. So yeah, thanks, thanks, Ren. So yeah, let's uh, uh, move uh, to our you know, next speaker. Yeah, we're supposed to have a little break in the middle, but we want to really keep the schedule. So we would really want to just follow our flow to our next uh, invited speaker. And uh, oh, Joe, yeah, you're already online. Great. It's, uh, I think you're probably in, you know, in the middle of another conference, but uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, you can open, uh, 
I think uh, share your slides. So before I give you introductions. So. Yeah, look like you start sharing. Okay, so go to the full screen. Okay, so, great. So yeah, great, great. Okay, so let me introduce. So our next uh, invite speaker is uh, Dr. Joseph Kaling from uh, NIST. And then, you know, also I want to give a little, you know, about intro, uh, bio, you know, introduction in his bio. Let's start with Kaling currently is a material research uh, engineer in a material science uh, engineer division. I think it's a polymer processing group, right? In NIST. So he's uh, obtained his uh, PhD degree from material science engineer from Stanford in 2005. And then he just uh, joined and started his uh, research career in NIST since 2005 from postdoc. And then his research involving developing a method for X ray metrology for complex 3D nanostructure, for, especially for semi semiconductor industry, including for the, uh, also development for next generation lithography, like UV lithography. So his group developed a critical dimension small angle scattering technique where it was recently transferred to semiconductor industry for memory fabrication and for characterize a high aspect ratio memory structure, such as like a 3D NAM. Um, he currently, you know, the project leader for the metrology for nano lithography project in NIST. Uh, he also have a grant with many awards, you know, including, uh, you know, the PICAS, uh, the present award in 2012, and also various NIST and also Department Commerce Award from 2009 up to 2018. He also got awarded for also uh, Fleming Award in 2019. So go ahead. Yeah, well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction and thank you for the, uh, the invitation to, to speak today. And so, as he said, my name is uh, Joe Klein, I'm at NIST, and I'm gonna be uh, talking about X-ray metrology specific for the, uh, the semiconductor industry. And so to start off, I just wanted to highlight some of the other people that contributed to the work that I'm going to be presenting today. In particular, at NIST, Dan Sunday has uh, contributed quite a bit to all of the work that I'm going to show. And Win Lee Wu is kind of like the, uh, the original creator of the cd method that I'll, I'll talk about some today. And so the measurements that we've done, we've uh, done a lot of measurements of various synchrotrons. And so I'll talk about results that we did at APS at DND CAP, particularly with Stephen Weigand. And I'll talk about measurements we did at ALS on beam line 11012 with Cheng Wang. I forgot to list on here. I'm also have some uh, results that we did from beam line 632 at ALS with the Eric Gullickson. And then the, the samples that we measured because we're focused on the kind of the x-ray side. And so anything we'd make would probably not be that interesting to look at. So we're very indebted to some very good collaborators. So we had a series of past collaborations with Intel and I'll show stuff that we got from a Marcus Kuhn and Scott List. And we have a very strong collaboration with the University of Chicago with Professor Paul Neely and Juan de Pablo. And then we also in the past worked pretty closely with the Professor Grant Wilson before he retired at University of Texas. And so just to sort of set the frame for what I'm gonna talk about, I just wanted to kind of go over some of the semiconductor industry metrology needs. And so obviously NIST is the sort of the head agency with the, the CHIPS Act and so, Last year in April, before the CHIPS Act was passed, we hosted a workshop series with uh, over 800 attendees from the semiconductor industry. And so on kind of the left side of the screen, you see a picture of the, uh, the document that we put out last August called Strategic Opportunities for US Semiconductor Manufacturing. And it kind of highlights a number of various grand challenges and very uh, important measurement challenges that the industry has. And so you can find that document at chips.gov if you haven't seen it. And so kind of the, uh, the, the driver for everything, obviously things are getting smaller. So you have these nano sheet gate all around structures. They're getting much more 3D and much more high aspect ratio, which would be like the 3D NAND structures. And then they're containing kind of more elements than ever before. So you can see on kind of the right side of the screen, the, uh, the, the periodic table from the, the 80s and then kind of the more recent version of how many new elements have been added to semiconductors to make them to, to, to keep working as, as well as they need to get them to work. And then I, I didn't put in here, but there's also the, the whole area of advanced packaging where you're doing heterogeneous integration, oftentimes where you're stacking various different types of chips together and getting very high bandwidth connections between the, uh, the chips. I have all the video pictures are in front of half of my screen. Okay, so now I can actually see the whole slide. And so for the uh, semiconductor industry, one of the big things that, that sort of drives a lot of the metrology that they need is obviously ultimately profit profitability, and that's driven through high yields. And so to, to get that, they have a, to use a lot of high throughput inline process control. And so when you look through the, uh, the, the, the fab, 
oftentimes in a lot of the processes, over 50% of the process steps are now various metrology methods. And then they also separate from that, especially when they're developing a new process and they're ramping up for manufacturing, that there's a huge amount of metrology that has to be done there to be able to make the new process work. And so those are both kind of the, the two biggest drivers for the, the various metrology needs that the, uh, the industry has. And obviously as they get things smaller and more complex, they need to, the measurements get more difficult. And so the next generation measurements that they have, they generally wanna have increased throughput and increased resolution, but of course they also want it to be cheaper too. And there's kind of a various ranges of things from dimensional properties, chemical, mechanical, electrical, and then also contamination controls kind of a major issue because a, a single five nanometer particle can mess up your whole CPU. And so now for what we're doing at NIST. So this is kind of an overview of the X-ray dimensional metrology project at NIST. So we have sort of two different aspects. We have kind of a, a fab-based X-ray metrology. So this is where the CD SACS method, you can see in kind of the middle top of the screen, that's a picture of our SACS system that we have that we use for developing the, uh, the CD SACS method. And so we've worked very closely with the industry. You can see a, a picture from a, a workshop that we had several years ago where we transferred a lot of the uh, technology that we had developed to the, uh, the, the industry. And then kind of the other half of the project is the synchrotron X-ray metrology. And so here, we're oftentimes trying to develop some sort of new measurement with the unique characterization capabilities for nanostructures. And so it may or may not be something that can eventually transition to the, to the fab. It just all sorts of depends. And one of the kind of the key areas in there that we've been developing that I'll talk about today quite a bit is using a resonant soft X-rays. So we're doing essentially similar measurements to the, uh, the CD SACS method, but instead of hard X-rays going through a whole wafer, we're using soft X-rays so we can get the, the chemical contrast, particularly in a lot of uh, lithography materials. And you can see a number of the different collaborators that we have of various projects over the last couple of years. And so first I'm gonna discuss the, uh, the CD SACS method or critical dimension small angle X-ray scattering. The critical dimension part comes to the semiconductor industry, anything that they're using for measuring sort of the size and shape of the uh, sort of the initial features, the smallest features that are in a, uh, a chip, they call it critical dimension, whatever the measurement is. So they have critical dimension scanning electron microscopy, critical dimension AFM, a number of different various things. And so CD SACS is it's essentially, it's a tr variable angle transmission SACS. And so we have the X-rays hit the wafer and you measure some sort of grading structure. And then we go through the wafer and then look at the scattering pattern as a function of angle. And so since we have this grading pattern, it's essentially single crystal diffraction where the nano pattern is the lattice. And then the pattern shape is essentially the kind of like your atom or like the protein if you're say doing protein crystallography. And so since we go through the wafer for classic CD SACs, it's always greater than 15 kV so that you minimize the transmission. And the most important part is that it has to be a periodic structure. And so you can measure 1D, 2D, or even 3D periodic structures. And then the other important aspect is that the average or the, the result is the average shape of this repeated nanostructure. And so this is actually very valuable for the semiconductor industry when they're doing process control because they want to get really good statistics. Because if you only look at say one thin set in the structure, that doesn't tell you very much about the other billion that you have. And so that's where it's very important and critical to have this uh, good statistical sampling. And then the, uh, the primary limitation for at least bringing it away from the synchrotron is X-ray source brightness. And then if anybody's interested, you can go to this website here that we have a lot of uh, tutorial videos from on CD SACS that we recorded from the, some past workshops that we had. And so for kind of an example of it, that with the uh, making features smaller and smaller before EUV work, that they had to develop some tricks to be able to make smaller features. And so this is a spacer assisted double patterning where you can create a structure using conventional immersion lithography and you do uh, ALD to, de to deposit a conformal film. And then you can do a directional etch and it essentially just removes the, uh, the material from the bottom and the top of the line and it leaves the sidewalls there. And so then you rem remove the original structure that you have, and now you have something with half the pitch of what you started with. And so of course that wasn't good enough for them since the UV was delayed quite a bit. Oops. And they actually do that twice for a lot of the structures that they have. And so you essentially find an ortho orthogonal material and then you can repeat it again. And kind of the one of the big challenges that they had with this is if you don't have kind of the width of all three of your layers exactly tuned right, you can end up having a pitch error. And there was, they really want to have it look like you directly um, deposited it 
uh, or directly pattern it to the, the right pitch. And so they have a lot of tuning and a number of different things they have to adjust to be able to keep that right. And so the, uh, the example that you have in the left there, that video is essentially one of these samples. And so this is a, a composite uh, a scattering pattern that you get. So this is where you combine the different angles that you have onto a QX, QZ map. And so you can then take this, and so since it's not coherent scattering, you can't directly convert this into a shape. So we have to do an inverse iterative method where you create a trial solutions for what the shape is and then cycle through a couple million different um, guesses until you get something that, that matches. And so with this particular case, you can see there's a cross-sectional TM. And for the, the shape models that we use, typically you use trapezoid so that you have an analytical form for the Fourier transform. And you can then, as I said, adjust it until it fits the data well. And so Intel provided us the sample set where they they varied this sort of the A and the C ratio on here. And you can see in this particular case, we're able to get about nanometer resolution on what these different uh, pitch errors were. But of course, this was at the synchrotron to do the same thing on a lab for small structures like this would be uh, too slow to be able to actually commercialize it. And so the thing that then happened that was very nice is this was around the time that 3D NAND structures started coming out and they started getting really tall. And so in that particular case with, with NAND, the, essentially the flash memory that you have in all your solid state devices, that they, they stopped shrinking it about 10 years ago and started going vertical. And so when they do this, they actually create these several micron tall stacks, and then they do a very high aspect ratio etch to make what they call like the contact holes. And then they deposit all of the different layers to create the flash cells at the same time so that it's a, a parallel process. And so these structures, and then the current ones, they can be up to like 10 microns tall, and you have essentially a 40 nanometer wide hole that I said is like five to 10 microns tall and it has to be straight. So on the right side of the screen, you can see some of the various things that can happen when you're doing the, uh, the etching where you could have very various excursions from what you optimally would want. And so if it's not straight, that changes the way the flash cells work. And if you start having twist or tilt, you can end up having like a bit shift in there. And so none of those are very good. And so they need ways of being able to measure and characterize this. And so in this particular case, the, the CD SACs ended up being kind of perfect because the scattering intensity scales with the square of the height of the structure. And so with these particular things, when you're say four to 10 microns tall compared to like the 40 to 100 nanometer tall synthets that we were looking at before, you suddenly are scattering 10,000 times stronger. And so this started being uh, commercialized a couple of years ago, but it was mostly kind of small scale, but this is the uh, SPI advanced lithography meeting two years ago. And this was kind of the first time that groups other than NIST had presented on a CD SACS. And you can see that there's a Bruker semiconductor, there's a Kioxia, which used to be Toshiba memory, and then KLA. It's a, a paper that they did with, with Micron. And so for part of the industry transfer, just kind of looking back at that part a little bit, that the, uh, the CD SACS method, and it's actually probably almost like 20 years that NIST has been, been working on it before it went to a uh, industry. And so when we were doing the early measurements, quite a bit of it was done at the synchrotron, went to APS, ALS, SSRL, and NSLS1 and 2, quite a bit when we we're doing the, uh, the development. And then the thing that's really exciting for us, as you said, it's been commercialized, but the uh, KLA actually announced in December an entire new product line based on the, the CD SACS method. So if you go to their website, they have all sorts of different announcements and, and videos and stuff discussing this uh, new product line. And so for now, the, uh, the next part that I'm gonna discuss is some of the measurement challenges for lithography materials. And so in particular on the left would be sort of like a, a exposure of a, a photoresist that you have, particularly now there are EUV patterns. So it wouldn't be a, a transmission mask like I show there for EUV, but it's just sort of a simplified way of looking at it. And so there's a lot of questions there about how the, uh, the resists actually work and what the, the local nanoscale chemistry changes are. And then they also use a block of polymers for something called directed self-assembly. And so I'll talk about this quite a bit more in the next couple of slides. And they also have particularly like hard masks made out of amorphous carbon where there's a number of questions there in those soft materials too about how the, uh, the, the local nanoscale changes in the, uh, the chemistry are. And so for this is I'll talk about the next slide that we're using soft X-ray methods and we're doing both scatter and reflectivity and spectroscopy that said that you can get both local chemistry and pattern shape. And so for soft x-rays, the, uh, the initial part here is just showing next aft spectroscopy, which is, you look at the, the near edge, you see this a fine structure that's on there. And so this fine structure actually comes from the specific molecular bonds that you have in the materials. In particular here, 
In the middle, you can see this is the polystyrene and PMMA. And so red would be the polystyrene. And so that the peak that you see there on the left is come from the carbon-carbon double bonds that you have in the styrene ring. And like the peak that you see in PMMA is coming from the carbon-oxygen double bonds. And then the other peaks that you have are just from some of the uh, single bonds that you have in the material. But you can see there's pretty large differences in the, uh, the absorption of the, those two materials. And so because of that, you can get very strong um, contrast from them in both scattering and reflectivity. And the nice thing with this is you can adjust the contrast between the different materials just by changing the energy that you're looking at. So you don't have to do anything with staining or deuterating to be able to, to get contrast or to tune the contrast if you have more than two materials in there. And so we do this, uh, obviously the carbon edge, but we can also look at the nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine edge, and also some of the transition metals that are being used now for some of the, uh, the new resists. And so for the, the first example here, so this is the directed self-assembly of block of polymer and work that we've done with the professor Paul Neely's group at University of Chicago. And so the, this is the process flow that he developed. So it's kind of a very similar thing to the space resistant double patterning that I showed earlier, where you can make a larger pitch pattern and then reduce it in size to a, a smaller pitch pattern. And so in this particular case, you pattern a, a chemical template. You can then put a, a a neutral brush between it, and then you can then use that chemical template to epitaxially align a block of polymer that has a, a pitch that's an integer multi or an integer fraction of what the, uh, the original template was that you uh, printed on the, the wafer. And so you can do like 2x, 3x, 4x reduction. And the interesting part, I'm not talking about this today, but the industry is actually using this in one-to-one -one for making much smoother lines from patterns that they, they make from EUV lithography. And so this is showing an example of the td Sachs method that we did there. And so with hard x-rays, there's no contrast between PS and PMA. And so this is at the, the carbon edge at 282 EV. And you can see the, there's quite a few scattering peaks that you get in here versus if you do the hard x-rays, you only see maybe one or two peaks. And so this is just showing vertical line cuts through that data and then uh, showing the fits to that data. And so this is a, a, a structure then that was fit to it. So the kind of the waviness at the bottom is actually I don't think that's the way the structure really is. There's actually fluctuations in the material along there. And so since we're measuring the average structure, that when you have something that's not the same the whole way through from those fluctuations, that can sometimes give rise to a little bit of a, a strange pattern there. And so working with the Neely group, they fab fabricated a series of different samples for us where they, they varied the width of this guide stripe here at the, end, the bottom. And then we applied the cd Sachs method to it. And you can sort of see as this, so the red part here, which is this guide stripe, as that gets bigger, you can see that the, the fluctuations go down a little bit. Particularly, I think the fluctuations here are big because this uh, guide stripe here is smaller than what the polystyrene is, so it's not really happy. And so once that gets a little wider, it gets a little happier and then can spread out. And then when you get bigger, it starts to not get happy. And so kind of between this third one and the fourth one, you actually can't get the epitaxial alignment to work. And then once you get big enough, you then get a, a, a shift in the, uh, the thing where it's now centered with PMMA on top of the polystyrene instead of the polystyrene being on top of the polystyrene. And so for now, kind of the next part of looking a little bit closer, there's a lot of interest on these interfaces because you want to make very smooth lines. And so in looking at different materials that you have, there's also sometimes you have to do tricks to get them to stand up where you put a top coat on there. And so we can do very similar measurements that I showed before the soft x-rays, but use reflectivity instead and look at kind of a vertically oriented films and then get a depth profile of the chemistry. And so I'm gonna to talk today about some top coat work that we did with the Grant Wilson's group where we're looking at how much the top coat mixes with the, uh, the polymers underneath it. But you can also look at the interface sharpness, which we have a number of papers looking at that. Or you can look at, if you have a third component or an additive, you can do the reflectivity measurement and see where in the material the, uh, the uh, additive goes. I mean, as long as you have chemical bonds that are different between the, the three different materials. And so now for the, uh, the top coat material. So in this particular case, we took homopolymers of the two blocks that you have there and then put the top coat on top of it. And so Grant Wilson's group, they developed a, a tunable top coat. And so they can adjust the chemistry of this top coat to change its surface energy so that they can get the right surface energy for the, uh, the top coat to, uh, to get the, homo or the block of polymers to stand up. And so we did the, the reflectivity measurements on these homopolymers. And then in doing that, you can see here, this is a particular case of polystyrene. This is the different reflectivity curves at the fits that you have on there. And from this fit, you get an interfacial width between the, uh, 
the top coat and the homopolymer. And so you can see here on kind of the red side, I guess the red ones here are the, uh, the, the polystyrene, and then the blue ones are this uh, PTMSS. And you can see how the, uh, in this particular one, as you get lower concentrations of the IT butyl group, that you can see it gets sharper, and that means they don't like each other as much. And similar with the polystyrene, it's opposite. And kind of this in the middle here, where they both have about the same interfacial width, ends up being where you have a neutral surface that makes the block of polymer stand up. And so for these same type of measurements, we're extending them now to uh, look at UV photoresist. And so you can look at the, the photochemical pattern that's formed in the, uh, the UV resist from the UV exposure before you do the, the development. And then there's also a lot of interest of how the uh, underlayer interacts with the EUV resist. And so in particular, these are like some of the different examples you could think about that might happen there where you might have a lot of mixing between the resist and the underlayer, it might be sharp, or you could even have interfacial chemistry that occurs there. And then there's also a lot of interest of looking at the underlayer after you remove the resist to see how the any sort of residual aspects of the resist might be changing the uh, chemistry of the underlayer, particularly if they mix a lot, you might not be able to get all the components of the resist back out. And so one other thing I wanted to cover briefly in some work that we're doing, since we do all, all of this work looking at a lot of different gradings, that we used it to uh, develop a, a new uh, standard reference material for a SACS calibration. And so it might be of interest for other measurements as well. So th this is a, it's a tungsten grading. So it's a hundred nanometer stick of tungsten with a hundred nanometer pitch. And it's on a silicon nitride membrane so that you can get good transmission through it and pretty much any energy from anywhere from EUV up to uh, the hard X-rays. And superimposed on top of the 100 nanometer pattern is a, a one micron square pattern. And so by having that sort of the, the super lattice structure that you have there, you can see you get a very complicated two dimensional scattering peak so that you have in there. And so it makes it very nice for being able to uh, calibrate the detector. And if you zoom way in and have something like with soft x-rays where you have really high resolution, you can see the, the little dots that are coming from the, the one micron square array on there. And so this is, it's almost ready for full production. We had a wafer fabricated with 145 test structures, and we just recently compu or completed the uh, pitch certification process on it. And so it's pretty close to 100 nanometers for it's pretty uniform across the, uh, the whole wafer. And so just to finish up, I wanted to kind of discuss a little bit about some of the uh, unique synchrotron measurements that can be done and how that applies back to the, the semiconductor industry. So this is stuff not that my group that has done, but stuff that other people have done and just kind of uh, relaying a lot of what we've learned from a lot of meetings that we've had with the semiconductor industry and what their kind of needs are where x-rays can uh, help them out. In particular, the, the first thing on here is just kind of an example with the IBM and NSLS2 where they're looking at silicon germanium nanosheet structures. And in this particular case, they could uh, do uh, use a nanoprobe to do diffraction and fluorescence on the uh, silicon germanium multilayers in the nanosheet to be able to map out the, the local strain. For In this particular case, I don't have any data, but this is for advanced packaging where you have chips that are stacked. And particularly when you go to smaller and smaller scales of the, uh, the connections between them, particularly when you go to like copper, copper bonding and you get down to a couple micron pitch on the, the structures, you suddenly have millions of connections between these dyes that are stacked on top of each other. And they need to be able to image those million connections to make sure all of them are connected or if any of them fail, they need to be able to see that. So they do quite a bit of uh, X-ray imaging on that. But you can imagine with like lab systems, you can't quite get the, the resolution that you need because as they get smaller and smaller, you suddenly might have a 200 to 500 nanometer thick structure there on the, the copper pillars that are connecting the, the different structures. And to be able to actually resolve anything of that, you're gonna need 50 to 100 nanometer resolution at least and that to be able to see. And so you can't really do that over a very large area with small, uh, like um, I guess well, small like lab-based X-ray systems. And then on the right is the, the Paul Scherer Institute work where they've done the, uh, the 3D tychography looking at chips where you can then zoom in and get down to about 10 or 11 nanometer resolution on the chips. And so of course the semiconductor industry is very interested when they see this, but for them that they, they really wanna be able to take this and apply it much more frequently and not just see it in a paper. And so sort of the, the key opportunities where a lot of these different measurements can be applied is and particularly in the uh, accelerating the development ramp through kind of like a unique problem solving. And then another area would be for a failure analysis to identify sources of your yield excursion. And so many of these methods, obviously they don't easily scale to a uh, compact sources. 
And so for challenges for the industry synchrotron access, particularly if you look at the PSI thing, just having it in a nature paper isn't really valuable to be an industry. It's very cool and gives them a lot of ideas, but you really need to have something that's available that they can use frequently. So this would be something where, as I mentioned, they'd wanna use failure analysis. And this might be a case where you have billions of VOs and miles of wires, and they wanna be able to identify the small number of them that are bad in that large C. And so for them, kind of time to solution is the, the key. And to be able to do that, they oftentimes need expert help, both in the measurement and analysis, and then timely and frequent access to beam time, and then also potentially like easy proprietary access models. And then this is sort of just sort of brief part about getting measurements that could be transitioned to the fab. And so in particular this case, like a lot, a lot of times they wanna have something that would be, if it's gonna be in line, it needs to be kind of like a less than one minute measurement time or if offline, it might be several hours. And so that's where it gets very challenging to be able to, uh, to get something to, to go, particularly with compact X-ray sources that they, there's been some improvements in them but it really hasn't improved that much. And kind of the key things that would need to be improved are particularly brightness, but it would be many orders of magnitude of brightness. And then for many things, energy tunability or resolution and obviously coherence for certain of the ap application. And so the commercial compact X-ray sources, the industry's kind of finally started to realize that it's not going to, to have a kind of a paradigm shift in the next couple of years. And so because of that, they're starting to look much more at trying to make use of synchrotrons. And in the past, they usually just would do it for, they said more like these one-off experiments. And so the kind of the sort of the, some of the potential solutions that we've talked with the industry where they're, they're looking at is where you could imagine like dedicated time on an existing beam line is that the current putting in a proposal and getting beam time in nine months isn't gonna be valuable for what they need to do. Potentially like dedicated new beam lines, something essentially modeled after like what the, the pharmaceutical industry does with all of their beam lines potentially further down the road, maybe even a dedicated facility they've talked about. And then they've also discussed potentially even building a uh, synchrotron at a fab facility. And so you can sort of think about this, the new fabs are over $20 billion. And so like even just one of the EV exposure tools when they go to the high numerical aperture EV is $300 million just for that one. And they have to have probably five to 10 of those. But the industry's also been very willing to spend a lot of money in fabrication tools, but typically not on metrology tools. So we'll see what ends up coming out of this. And so just to kind of uh, summarize, the, the initial stuff I talked about was the, uh, the CD SACS measurement that we, we developed and were able to transfer to industry that they're now using in uh, memory fabs. But I showed you some examples of work that we've done with the, uh, the soft X-rays looking at new lithography materials, particularly with these block of polymers being developed for directed self-assembly. And then, and finally, I just sort of discussed a little bit about the working with the semiconductor industry, and particularly since a lot of they're running into lots of problems now as they're making these smaller and more complex structures that are very difficult to solve with any type of measurement, X-ray or electron or whatever they happen to have in the lab. So they're looking for lots of other different potential ways that they can can solve the uh, the problems that they have for developing these these new structures. But kind of key to it though is they need to have a fairly fast time to solution. So for many cases, like several days is not kind of unreasonable to be able to get the fast time to solution, particularly if they're doing TEM now, often I'm saying they already have to sometimes wait a few days to get the, uh, the result. And that there's kind of a potential opportunity for a dedicated beam time or beam lines or facilities maybe down the road uh, if they decide to put money or if money comes from kind of other sources. And so with that, I thank you all for your attention. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions. Yeah, thanks, Joe. That's a very, uh, very you know, uh, intrusive, uh, you know, uh, you know, talk. They have many information, which is pretty interesting to, I believe, our user community. I think uh, you know, before people ask any question, they have a you know few quick comments on that because uh, you just talk about the last slide for what synchrotron can help. I think a dedicated beam line could be you know really way to go. I think uh, well, right now probably not really fully you know official announced, but I think APS will think about that using one of the retired or unused uh, pharmacy beam line, converting to a one maybe dedicated hut for this uh, mm. typography where the, they call you know, laminography technique for this uh, mm. three-dimensional view of this uh, microchip. So I think, yeah, I think that's a very good uh, uh, suggestion. And also, well, except that at the APSU up upgrade, we have a lot of a new coherent capability, especially we have a one beam lines called a CSSI, 
uh, coherent, you know, uh, or you know, uh, green incidence coherent uh, small angle scattering beam line. I think there are a lot of new, you know, capability probably can use in combining coherence, uh, combining the the critical dimension sacs you already you already you know practiced for so many years to provide a more three dimensional, uh, you know, uh, uh, microscopy for those uh, those kind of like a pattern. I think uh, yeah, I see Jin Wang raise hand. I think Jin, you can comment on that because you're gonna leader for the new beam line, right? Go ahead, Jin. Jin, open your mic. Okay, so uh, Joe, uh, so very, very, very nice uh, talk. So that uh, uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, so a lot of information. Uh, so uh, my question is, any uh, of those uh, uh, metrology uh, methods, uh, what the, uh, give you the defects and all, you know, all these things are, are more uh, readily? Yes. So with defects, it's kind of tricky. So with the semiconductor industry, often defects might be like parts per billion or parts per trillion. Right. And so in particularly that case, it gets very, very difficult to have kind of like the signal to noise and the sensitivity to see that. I mean, with some of the coherent tychography, if you get like a full 3D image, then you could very possibly see, especially if you map around as well, then you could potentially see things and kind of like the parts per million or maybe less ratio in that, but it really takes a lot of data to be able to have sufficient data to see right. yes. kind of the, the defect labels, levels that they care about. Yeah, you need a lot of uh, data and also uh, very, very high resolution so that the, yeah. you know, so that the, so that will make things a lot more difficult, you know, too. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I really appreciate that the, all your uh, comments, everything. So um, mm -hmm. uh, this is a, certainly uh, something, you know, we're thinking about. And uh, uh, so, so uh, actually we're preparing, a, 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 you know, a paper that the, uh, may be related to this. And so once it's come out, uh, you know, uh, you know we, we could have a, you know, uh, a more discussion about this. So, mm -hmm. Let me see question. Oh, a quick question, uh, Joe, for you. You talk about because industry for sure is, we, they cannot build a synchrotron easily, or you know. But you talk about the compact swords. I know in recent years the compact uh, tabletop X3 sword actually also have a very rapid development. Do you thinking? How about maybe five or ten years later, maybe the compact swords, the flux or brightness, you know, well, probably still cannot compare to the first generations in you know synchrotron sword, but still is that maybe large enough or high enough to maybe provide a more inline monitoring or inline uh, calibration during the production. For example, like, a, the, the, like, like the critical sex technique. Do you think it's possible? Or... Yes, I mean, yeah, it's certainly possible. And it's certainly, I mean, a lot of the measurements that they need, particularly, I mean, even like a lot of X-ray tomography, they really need maybe like a hundred X increase in flux and similar with like the CD sacs. So in fourth generation, you definitely don't need to be able to get most of the measurements. Obviously you need fourth generation to do the tychography with the mm -hmm. kind of like the couple nanometer resolution that they want. But the vast majority of the things you could do with something much slower. And so with the, the, the compact sort of tabletop type sources or at least the big table mm -hmm. tabletop sources that it's a lot of those and pretty clear. I mean, there was a company Lintian for a while that I've met with them numerous times over the last kind of 15 years. And it was always a couple of years away. And actually, this last year they went bankrupt finally, but they, they never actually were able to, to de deliver it. And so there's been a couple of different companies like that where it seemed kind of very promising that they might be able to get this 10 to 100x increase in flux. But for at least kind of the, uh, those particular ones, it just never really quite made it. It was kind of too complicated and maybe a little too expensive of a. Um, a machine. I mean, there's certainly other people that are working at various inverse Compton scattering type sources. Yeah, yeah. That, but but everything, I mean, in like 2012, I thought a lot of them, everybody was sure they were a couple years away. And so it's kind of like fusion, I guess, where it's always kind of a couple years away for it. But most of them haven't really made that much progress in the last 10 years. Yeah, I can imagine it's pretty it's pretty challenged. You know? So probably you know for metrology field also need a company like uh, you know you know Asmo, right? I mean for the lithography, yeah. so type of you know it's very high risk. I know that that's very yeah. 
highly capital you know, business. And uh, uh, yeah, is there any more questions from the audience? Because we want to you know, move forward to, to the schedule. And uh, yeah, I, I hope that Joe, you know, after next year, APSU come back, you know, a NIST uh, people or, you know, engineer researcher can really come to APS using the, uh, our first generation sword to do some, you know, fancy work there. So like Jing, yeah, like, no, it's yeah, like this. Yeah, it's definitely very exciting and we look forward to be able to, to use okay. it. But if anybody has any questions or comments, feel free to, to comment me or contact me. My email's there at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah, I see the email. Yeah. Okay, so I don't see more questions. So let's uh, thanks to Joe again for an exciting talk about metrology, and then we are move to our next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. And Dylan, are you? Oh yeah, Dylan, you're there. So let's. Uh, you can open your. All right. Video and share screen. sharing. <clears throat> great, great. Okay, so uh, I will get, also give an introduction. So uh, next, uh, our next invited speaker is uh, Dr. Dylan Fong from Argonne. So although I know uh, Dylan for many years, but I still want to give a you know introduction for the bio. <laughs> so, yeah, okay, but I, I, hopefully audience probably won't know better. So so Dr. Fong is a currently principal mature scientist in mature science division, Argonne. And then Dylan got his PhD from applied physics from Harvard in 2001. And then he just uh, joined Argonne, started his research career, you know, from postdoc, and, you know, uh, to right now, the principal, uh, principal material scientist. And he was uh, recognized in uh, 2009 for the PCAS, also the prize and work. His research really focused on using the, you know, in situ synchrotron X-ray technique, various kind of technique, coherent, uncoherent, to investigate a behavior material in complex or dynamic environmental, especially during the, Especially for the you know oxide heat structure synthesis and also a lot of a uh, uh, fire electric you know property. So Dylan is our very long time and very active user and also major driver to establish this uh, in situ mature synthesis capability at the APS uh, uh, synchrotron the beam line, including oxide B, PLD, MOCBD for all kinds of electronic you know and also very you know technically technical important material and uh, and also have a build a the one of the few very dedicated, you know, this kind of uh, in situ synthesis instrument uh, in our, you know, uh, beam line, which is uh, very, very rare, this kind of instrument across the global synchrotron community. So go ahead, Dylan. Okay, thanks, Juan. All right, so I guess you can see everything, right? It's yeah, okay? yeah, it's pretty, pretty clear. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, thanks to Juan. I have a lot of collaborators to thank. I won't go through every everybody here. Uh, I just want to mention uh, Ching Tong Zhang at, uh, at APS also. Uh, Wa Jun, who I think is giving a talk tomorrow. And then a bunch of others from uh, Oak Ridge, including those who grew a film and uh, have been doing some of the theory work. <laughs> so first I'll, I'll talk about Wa Jun's work, just showing this slide. So uh, one of my key interests is in uh, understanding oxygen vacancy behavior. And so it's fairly easy to see oxygen vacancy uh, movements with x-rays. You just have to know where to look and you have to know, um, well, you have to know where to look and watch in situ. So on the left, I'm showing uh, the electroformed conducting filament in a tungsten oxide uh, epitaxial film. So uh, the top shows the tungsten fluorescence, the middle panel shows the oxygen concentration, and the bottom shows the uh, Bragg peak intensity. So you can see that as we form this conducting filament, it's really uh, creating a lot of havoc in that, in that material. It's basically making it amorphous and displacing the tungsten all over. Uh, in the low resistance state, uh, which is the middle column, you can see that the um, oxygen vacancies have made a conducting path. And in the high resistance state on the right, you can see that the vacancy channel has now, now gone away. And so that's why it's a high resistance state. <clears throat> so you can see all of this with x-rays, but you again have to do this in situ. So I'll move on to my 
I think my favorite system right now is dystronin cobalt oxide. Uh, it undergoes a topotactic phase change from the perovskite, or sometimes I say the 113 phase. Uh, the perovskite, of course, is made of all oxygen octahedra. Uh, and then when you remove some of the oxygen, you form the brown millerite phase, which is the 112.5 phase. Uh, it's nice because you can switch between these two phases topotactically. So there's really almost no effect on the crystal uh, quality. Um, and at the same time, you're changing it from a ferromagnetic conductor to an anti-ferromagnetic insulator. <clears throat> and others like Sri Ram and Pu Yu have discussed this system and, and mentioned how it's a nice system for studies of uh, switching and potentially uh, synaptic memories. Um, <clears throat> so that's one of the areas we, we're exploring now. So I'm really going to discuss work that's several years old, but we started off with uh, strontium coupled oxide grown by PLD on uh, strontium titanate, 001, so it's all epitaxial. So this was grown and then uh, put into this furnace. I'm showing at the center of this differentometer. <clears throat> and this furnace allows you to switch uh, between nitrogen and oxygen. I'm showing the gas control panel there. And um, <clears throat> you can switch as you look at the, you know, the Bragg peak. And th this is at sector eight, which is specializing in coherent X-ray studies. So I'll be discussing both the kinetics of the phase transition and the dynamics of the phase transition. Uh, one of the reasons why I like this system so much is because the strontium calmodite perovskite phase has these integer uh, Bragg peaks. There's our one, two, and three. Uh, when you switch to the brown millerite phase, because it's made of this, these layers of oxygen octahedra and oxygen tetrahedra, you double the, uh, the repeat unit in the out of plane direction. And so in reciprocal sp space, you get these half order reflections, like zero, zero, half. And so we can just watch the phase change uh, in C2 by watching the zero, zero, half come and go. And so on the left, I'm showing you the Bragg peak. It's on a CCD. Uh, this is from the zero, zero, half. <clears throat> and this particular experiment is done at 300 degrees. And we're essentially starting off in pure nitrogen. And at time zero, we're gonna to switch to pure oxygen. And you can see, I wish I could show my arrow here, but that's good. Uh, <clears throat> on the top right, the intensity from the zero zero half as we switch to oxygen and it dies off. You can see that it takes over 10,000 seconds to fully die away at 300. Um, and we also did Zanes at the cobalt K edge, which is around 7.7 .7 keV. And you can see that it totally goes from uh, three to 3.7. Um, and there's two observations here. <clears throat> One is that the intensity from the zeros are half peak. So again, that's really come, coming from oxygen vacancy ordering to make this brown millerite structure. Uh, you can see that the intensity starts to die away before there's really any change in the oxidation state of cobalt. Uh, and then after a couple hundred seconds at, uh, at, in pure oxygen, the cobalt oxidation state starts to take off. Um, <clears throat> but there's, there's no change from cobalt 3 plus to cobalt 4 plus, uh, which is what you would expect for brown millerite to perovskite. And so I would say that for these samples grown on strontium titanate, it's very hard to get pure, you know, pure stoichiometries. It's always somewhere, you know, between uh, the um, brown millerite uh, 2.5 phase and the perovskite 113 phase. <clears throat> and then, uh, we switch back to nitrogen. This is again at 300. 
Um, <clears throat> and you see again that it takes quite a long time. Uh, the intensity of the zeros or half slowly goes up and the cobalt oxidation state slowly goes down um, <clears throat> to get back down to around 3.2 plus, it takes even longer than 10,000 seconds. Uh, and so we do see there's, instead of this rapid change in the oxygen, you know, relatively rapid change in the oxygen concentration, there's this slow change in the, uh, in the oxygen. It's a gradual loss of oxygen. Um, and because we're looking at both the Bragg peak intensity coming up as well as the, the Zanes, you can see that the order of the brown millerite peak first happens um, before you, you get a lot of oxygen. <clears throat> uh, and so we could analyze this phase transition with the Avrami equation, which I'm showing in the lower left. Uh, so Y is the volume fraction, K is the nucleation rate, and N is the dimensionality of the transition. And so uh, the, the dashed line shows the fit to the Avrami equation. And <clears throat> when we switch from the brown millerite to the perovskite phase, we get uh, a dimensionality of one, okay? N is equal to one for this transition. And so that suggests that it's a 1D transition, presumably from the top, okay? So you're, you're turning on oxygen at 300 or you know, between 300 and 350, oxygen comes in at the top, it has to break apart into atomic oxygen, enter the lattice, and it's essentially propagating from top to bottom, which makes sense. Now, when you switch back to the brown millerite phase and you switch back to uh, nitrogen, uh, this has the N of three, meaning a three-dimensional process. And one can sort of rationalize this by saying, okay, it doesn't have to start at the top and move down to the bottom. It's, it's really just an ordering uh, problem. So you have a lot of oxygen vacancies. Uh, what you really need to do is create a nucleus of brown millerite where the oxygen vacancies are ordered. And then, you know, you can propagate from that. So it's a 3D nucleation problem. And so uh, this is what I'm trying to draw in this uh, schematic over here. And so for the kinetics of the phase transition, this is our overall uh, drawing. This is described in Cheng Tung's PRL. Uh, I just have to also add that the uh, the temperature dependence of these processes allows you to get the activation energy. And we do see there's different activation energies for these uh, different phase transitions. And uh, we discussed that in the paper. So I think a few of the, the speakers did mention the APS upgrade. Of course, since I'm at Argonne, I'm very interested in this. Uh, especially because now the APS is shut down. It's shut down from April of this year to uh, 2024, and some beam lines will take longer to come back up again. Uh, some new beam lines will, will appear. Um, <clears throat> on the left, I'm showing the brightness versus uh, photon energy. Uh, the nice thing about the APS is that it does go high, does go to high photon energy. So you could dig down into samples and have more penetration. Um, and for example, I like going to different K edges and doing zanes or resonance scattering. So you can do that for these transition metals in the, in the higher photon energy range. Uh, the APS today is shown um, by the dash red line and the APS upgrade is shown by the solid red line. The brightness increases between 100 and 1,000. And of course, the big winner is CDI uh, or uh, coherent diffraction imaging. People here, of course, like to do tychography and, and Bragg CDI, where you essentially, you know, uh, look at a Bragg peak, for example, and uh, you look at the scattering on your error detector. And because you're scattering coherently, you could do a 3D volume map of your, your Bragg peak and then invert that by a Fourier transform uh, into your, you know, your nanoparticle or whatever you're looking at. 
the the other big winner that I want to emphasize is XPCS or X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy. So I'm showing a reciprocal space map uh, <clears throat> uh, that you can get today from the APS. It's on the left. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm showing the same reciprocal space map that you can get after the upgrade. And I'm showing you what speckle is. It's, it's basically little pixelated areas uh, <clears throat> Uh, on your area detector, and these these speckle uh, these speckles come from defects in your material. And when you're scattering with coherent X-rays, the defects produce phase shifts. And at any you know finite temperature, these phase shifts will will move with time. And so you can get fluctuations, you know, fluctuation information about your defects. And so that's what I think of when I think about XPCS. So, you know, one way we analyze this, these changes in speckle is with this two-time correlation function. You could, you could use different correlation functions. This is the most popular one. Um, and as described in this paper in, in 2017, um, the equation is shown below, but the, the important thing is that, you know, you, like I said, you could look at this CCD image of your Bragg peak or whatever you're looking at as a function of time. And you can essentially look at the average, which is the sort of the, uh, uh, the horizontal line, okay? That's not really changing with time. But if you look at the speckle, that is fluctuating with time. And so if you took your same material, took it down to very low temperature, tried to do you know, a two-time correlation, Function, you may not see anything. You would see this sort of this red square because there's new, no decorrelation. But if you took that same material, has defects, you took it up to high temperature, you might get this uh, blue box in the corner, uh, and that comes from fast decorrelation. And so all the defects are now fluctuating like crazy. At intermediate temperatures, you would expect something inter you know, in between. And so I'm drawing this uh, map where you have a material that is simply changing state. It's going from A to B to C to D, okay? And this is something that could easily happen. It's just changing its, its, you know, its statistics, right? <clears throat> and so we did that experiment for our strontium carbon dioxide and strontium titanate at sector eight. And so, on the left, I'm showing the two-time correlation map uh, where we switched from, let's see, pure nitrogen to pure oxygen at 330 degrees. And so we are changing from uh, the, uh, yeah, the, the brown Mallory phase into the perovskite phase. Um, <clears throat> the, yeah, again, what I call the dynamics is shown on the left and the kinetics are shown on the right. So again, the kinetics we already discussed, it's just simply the loss of the brown millerite -right peak as a function of time. The information in the two-time correlation function it can be best described by taking these horizontal cuts. So I'm showing a cut at uh, point A, point B, and point C. Uh, and so if we look at the correlation as a function of time uh, for A, B, and C, uh, we could, you know, just draw some arbitrary correlate, you know, some arbitrary dashed line uh, at uh, point one, and then we can say these these uh, correlation times tau c are uh, given at the the bottom axis. Anyway, you see that the from these changes in the decorrelation time, that the speed of the fluctuation uh, increases during the transition. Okay, this is what XPCS is telling us about this, this one-dimensional transition, right? I showed it's, it's a one-dimensional transition. Now I can see that from the XPCS that these things fluctuate slower when you're early into the transition and the interface, you know, I'll call it just the interface, is fluctuating more rapidly, faster, you know, uh, into or longer into the transition. And there's a lot more information in, in Ching Tung's paper, but 
that's the kind of information we can get from XPCS. The other good description is shown by this, uh, this work on, um, again, strontium carbon oxide on LSAT. And here, I'll just describe some of the experiments we conducted for uh, strontium carbon oxide um, in equilibrium. So uh, when you grow strontium carbon oxide on strontium titanite, strontium titanate, like I already discussed, it really favors the brown Mori phase, okay? I'm showing the lattice parameter at the bottom. And so the, the perovskite phase is on the left. Uh, the brown Mori phase is on the right. You see the brown Mori is pretty close to the STO lattice parameter. Uh, but if you grow strontium carbon dioxide at LSAT, it's sort of sitting in between the perovskite and the brown Mori. Uh, which makes it more interesting. So if I were to plot the intensity of the zero, zero and a half peak again, we can see that it's fairly stable with time. So this is the zero, zero and a half uh, for these different temperatures from 300 to uh, 360 Celsius, uh, all in nitrogen. But Although the intensity is, is stable, if we plot the XPCS, the, the uh, two-time correlation function, we see that it's, it's fluctuating like crazy, okay? And so it's hopping between order and disordered states. And this was taken um, at 350 in nitrogen. <clears throat> and so one way we can think about this is that um, you know, there's, there's partial correlation, is that at, at time one, you might have some areas of your sample uh, that remain the same. I'm just cutting this piece, or cutting these, these samples into octants, and the, the checkbox shows an octant that remains the same from time one to time two, uh, but all the other octants have uh, oxygen vacancy fluctuations, okay? And so that is a partially correlated state. And so if we look at the temperature dependence uh, of these two-time correlation maps, you can see that, as you would expect, there's more fluctuations at higher temperature, okay? And to contrast that, I'm showing you the two-time correlation map for uh, strong cobalt oxide on the STO lattice parameter at 340. So to contrast you know, the, the 340 at LSAT, which is right next to it, to the one that's on STO, you can see that the one at STO is essentially not moving. So to try to understand two-time correlation functions from a theory point of view, we, we turn to our friends at Oak Ridge. And so they came up with a phase field model uh, where we really just tried to make a simple model to understand you know, what is causing the fluctuations? What are the relative, uh, relatively important parameters? So with Ganesh, we worked on this free energy equation that are made, that's made of three components. One is a chemical component, uh, one is an elastic component, and the third component is a um, gradient energy. So that's like the interface energy between the, the brown miller and the perovskite. Um, <clears throat> so, they looked at uh, the, the free energy uh, as a function of the oxygen concentration on the horizontal axis. So it's 2.5 on the left, it's uh, uh, 113 on the, on the right, and it's LSAT on the left graph and STO on the right graph. And the, let's see, the chemical component is shown in the uh, dashed blue line. The, um, I'm sorry, the elastic component is shown in the, the uh, dashed blue line, the chemical contributions shown in the green, and the green shows um, values for uh, omega's 0.119 EV. That is the ion vacancy interaction energy. So that is essentially describing how much it wants to turn into the, the brown millerite phase uh, where you have ordered oxidative vacancies. And the purple dash line shows also the chemical component, but with a different interaction energy. So <clears throat> what we're trying to highlight here is that the total energy, which is in black, can be very flat 
okay, when you choose the right levels of this omega parameter, this omega interaction energy. Uh, and so we picked the one that was at 0.119 EV. So if we go with that 0.119 EV, the, the, um, the SCO on LSAT is flat. The one on STO is not flat. It's, it's favoring the, uh, the uh, 2.5 oxygen concentration. So, so that's a simple energy model. It, it doesn't say anything about these, these uh, uh, two-time correlation maps that we see. So uh, we had to go more complicated. So here, here I'll just demonstrate that. So for uh, LSAT with a interaction energy of 0.104 EV, we see no fluctuations in the two-time. Uh, we do see some fluctuations in the two time when we switch to a 0.119 EV, but it doesn't fluctuate back and forth, okay, which is what we really wanted to see. Uh, and getting the, the um, flat two time is relatively easy for um, the sample ground on, S, uh, on strontium titanate. So it, it's, you know, partially. Uh, getting our, our two time by uh, capturing the right elastic term, but it doesn't capture the right um, <clears throat> time scale. Okay. And so the guys at Oak Ridge had to go more complicated and use this uh, Con Hilliard equation that I'm showing uh, sort of at the bottom of the slide. So they use the, the Con Hilliard equation, which was originally developed for spinal decomposition. And they had to add a noise term, okay? So that's the eta term. And that corresponds to these local thermal fluctuations. And only if you have that noise term can you get this two-time correlation map I'm showing on the right, this blue one. Um, <clears throat> but again, we couldn't replicate anything like what we see on, on the top right of this slide. So they then made a... Uh, Omega that was time dependent. Okay, so that's the ion vacancy interaction term. And so they decided to uh, follow this Langevin equation, which I'm showing right here in the middle uh, for d omega dt. And you can see that they've now made it time dependent. And through some of these parameters, they could make it temperature dependent. Okay, so tau sub omega sets the fluctuation time scale, and, and they arbitrarily played with it and they could get it to you know, what, match what we see with 20 seconds. Uh, w is a random number coming from a Gaussian distribution. Okay, and I'm showing this Gaussian distribution on the, the bottom right. Uh, sigma is the width or the standard devi deviation of this Gaussian profile. And omega, like I showed on the previous slide, was found to be uh, 0.119 EV to give us uh, the right time scale. And so they found that they had to make this time-dependent interaction energy where omega is fluctuating between 0.119 and that plus 0 0.004 EV or that minus 0 0.004 EV. So that is the red halo around the, the black free energy curves that I'm showing on top and bottom. So this is the ultimate you know, relationship that they got for the strong coupled oxide grown on LSAT that's on the top and the one grown on uh, strong titanate at the bottom. But with this final result, they could replicate these two time correlation maps um, that I'm showing you at the, the top right here. So um, the one for LSAT is shown on the left, the one for strong titanate is shown on the right. And because these are, um, uh, simulations, they can show us the the real space uh, picture of what's going on. And so at different pieces in time, uh, at 745 seconds, you might see this for your structure. I'm showing you this. You can look at the middle horizontal panel uh, where there is the, um, I guess the horizontal bar is about eight microns in width. And so 
Uh, that plot at the bottom shows a eight micron plot where there's some variation in the oxygen concentration. And that small variation in oxygen concentration comes from that, that noise term. <coughs> Uh, later on at 930 seconds, you can, you can basically see that for the film grown on LSAT, there's now some phase separation, okay? And so you can see that by the larger change in the, in the uh, oxygen concentration as a function of distance, okay? So now you can see some peaks and valleys that correspond to real phase separation. Uh, and same thing for 945 seconds. Um, <clears throat> But again, for the same parameters, gronin, strontium titanate, the elastic term dominates. So you see no uh, fluctuations in your two time correlation. And so from this relatively simple energy model, uh, the, the theorists at Oak Ridge found that we could explain these two time correlation maps by assuming that this interaction energy between the oxygen uh, vacancies and, and you know ordering the oxygen vacancies, if that energy is fluctuating with time and with temperature, you can get these time scales. <clears throat> and I'll just end by saying that uh, we're now doing experiments in, with, again, strontium coupled oxide, uh, but these are bilayers and we are playing with ionic liquid gating. And this was, again, something that Sri Ram had been talking about uh, in, in a previous paper, and Pu Yu had been, uh, his group and others have been playing with this system. Um, <clears throat> and now we are playing with this system uh, with, with um, dynamic uh, studies using coherent x-rays. <clears throat> and here's just some of our initial data. This was uh, taken at sector rates. This is a bilayer of uh, the brown millerite with the perovskite. And these are L scans. Um, well, I'm showing you, a, you know, a, a map of L scans on the left to get at uh, different uh, voltages. And so you can see that at these different voltages, you can inject or, or remove oxygen vacancies. And we also uh, did measurements of the cobalt K edge so we could see how many uh, vacancies we're putting in or taking out. And the two time correlation maps are shown at the bottom right. <clears throat> so, in summary, uh, we've done a lot of in situ synchrotron studies into oxygen vacancy behavior uh, in strontium cobalt oxide. Um, we are trying to do most of the experiments with a coherent beamline like at sector eight. Uh, and so we could study the dynamics of oxygen vacancies moving in and out of our samples. Um, and uh, I would just encourage people listening to take advantage of these uh, major upgrades to the synchrotrons. Uh, ESRF is done and we're, we're doing ours now. Uh, but um, if you do have a coherent light source in the area, I urge you to do some XPCS experiments. A lot of people want to do CDI experiments, um, <clears throat> but if you're interested in in operando or in situ studies, like for uh, switching experiments, you should look at XPCS. And that's it. I'll be happy to take questions. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Dylan. So uh, is there any question from the audience? Yeah. Well, I have a question. So Dylan, wonderful presentation. Uh, sure. Actually, I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, you know, you showed these uh, fluctuation patterns. Have you ever tried keeping it, it, you know, especially this intermediate LSAT type scenario where you keep the system at some condition and then systematically add or remove energy to the system to verify whether the ion vacancy Simulation, simulated energy can be uh, matched with, you know, the energy you add or remove? Oh, well, we've done, of course, temperature studies. Like we, we, we look at it at 300 degrees. We look at it again at 310 degrees. We've done all those studies, but all the theory 
studies were done after the fact. So we don't have uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence. Uh, that is something that we could talk to our friends at Oak Ridge about and try to uh, see if the temperature, the temperatures and the uh, thermal energies would match. Um, <laughs> I would say that right now it's it's hard enough to get everything to to uh, be on the right order of magnitude. <laughs> so yeah, I, no, I mean, uh, the, the other question I was going to actually have, sorry, I have a few questions. You don't have to answer all of them, but the second one is uh, related to hysteresis because you're adding and removing a lot of mass. Uh, I wonder if you see like massive hysteresis present in, in, in your experiments. And then the third question is, you know, when we are talking about uh, let's say oxygen vacancies in zirconia, right? I mean, it's been studied for 100 years. Uh, you will see every textbook, every paper, they'll say, well, you know, once you go beyond a few percent of the defects, we can no longer work with dilute vacancies. Everything associates, you know, and then you start all the models break down, conductivity, saturate, all of these things happen. Oh. Uh, when we go from perovskite to brown millerite, you know, we are introducing massive quantities of vacancies. Uh, how effective are theories to deal with this type of uh, non-dilute defect densities? Oh, from the theory, well, let me discuss the hysteresis first. So I, I tend to think that this system was pretty good in terms of reproducibility. Uh, like I said, it never actually reached, you know, pure 112.5 or pure 113 stoichiometries. It was always, you know, around 2.7, 2.75. And so uh, it actually moved pretty smoothly from one stoichiometry to the other. It, it wasn't just, a, it, you know, it wasn't a large oxygen change, okay? So that's my caveat. Um, but we could fully go from one phase to the other. Sorry, I mean, like, kill off the brown right peak and bring it back. We could do mm -hmm. that pretty re reproducibly. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, and your question about the theory was, was there a problem? Whether, with you, whether, whether uh, you need to explicitly worry about uh, defect association in non-dilute scenarios or but, phase field automatically takes care of that. Yeah, because they, they basically started with the uh, regular solution model. So they, they were uh, already assuming it's a phase separated system. And so that's, yeah, yeah, that's why they already introduced the Omega parameter uh, that really accounts for oxygen vacancy ordering. So they account for a lot of oxygen vacancies already in the system, but whether or not they were ordered was something they had to explicitly account for, right? So you could have brown Mullerite phase, it's strong cobalt oxide 2.7, but you might have local areas where it's 2.7 or 2.8, right? And so maybe that area is starting to get a little bit more oxygen vacancy ordering. Uh, I'm sorry, I guess I have to say that inversely. 2.8 in some areas, that's 2.7. And so you might get a little bit more oxygen vacancy ordering in that, in that area. And that would be accounted for by this omega parameter. But they don't have to do any dilute solution uh, approximation. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, Sharan, I, I, I agree with your, your judgment. I think uh, for this uh, kind of, you know, toptatic phase transition, probably the dilute limit uh, theory won't work because, uh, you know, in dilute, you can treat in defect as an isolate, independent, or, you know, in a single body problem. But uh, for this kind of toptatic system, especially the, like cobotite, I think the concentration is so high and also forming the defect, but defects are correlated. I think that this has already become a highly correlated defect Mm -hmm. physics it's definitely not dilute a theory when you know work out so any semiconductor theory probably defect theory probably won't work out here i believe so. yeah no i mean dylan this is a new field the strongly correlated ion system strong correlated <laughs> defect yeah the defects are correlated because they have a short range or intermediate even long range ordering so you yeah. cannot treating that's like a single defect point defect this is not point defect anymore so theory need to be upgrade i believe yeah no i understand i mean looks like phase field is very well suited for this yeah thank so you. it is it is it yeah is. i think so yeah yeah but, uh, yeah so uh well i mean yeah there are a lot, lot of discussion we can make but i don't want to make the our workshop too late for the last talk from martin so 
So, uh, you know, if you don't have any question or you can maybe save a question a little bit in the very end, if we have a few more minutes. So Dylan, don't go away. <laughs> so, yeah, so Dylan already gave a very exciting introduction about APSU, especially coherent capability. I think Martin's talk is gonna follow in a trend, but from more, not from dynamic, but from more like a Mikorsky or time, time scale point of view. So let's uh, move to our Martin's talk. So uh, yeah, Martin, you can open your uh, slide. So like uh, before I int introduce you. Okay, so our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Martin Hawk from uh, uh, Nano Center. Although he's a bin line also, you know, you know, Sector 29 is locating APS, but uh, the group is uh, from the center of nano material. So Martin is uh, right now currently lead scientist group leader for electron uh, uh, and also X-ray microscopy group in uh, not a CNM nano center in Argonne. So Martin got his uh, uh, PhD uh, in 2002 and from UIUC, and then he go to McGill for postdoc for you know up to 2004. He joined AP uh, Argonne CNM since 2004, and also did, you know work on uh, this uh, high uh, hot X-ray nanopore beamline a project at that time it's just a project no beamline yet. So and then he really built up this uh, design constructing commission and build up this uh, hot X-ray nanopore beamline second 26, which is a uh, Called you know uh, uh, a manager by APS and also CNM. So Martin uh, are already you know developed a lot of program on that, including coherent diffraction you know extra diffraction imaging, BRAC tachography for nano structure study, and also he studied a lot of us you know uh, using this a uh, uh, nano uh, uh, microscopy study strain scaling and uh, structure dynamics. And recently I believe Martin will talk about some time resolve ultra fast capability you you know combining with a, a nano scale microscopy. So Martin also got this R&D 100 award in 2009 for the development of hot X-ray nanoprobe. Go ahead, Martin. I mean, and as, as part of a team, of course. It, it was funny you brought up my uh, thesis because when I finished my thesis, X-ray studies of lattice dynamics, I thought, oh, well, thank goodness that's over with. And uh, you know that only I think goes to show that the universe has a bit of a sense of humor. Uh, that here we are talking about lattice dynamics and using hard X rays to study them. But yeah, I'll be talking about recent results and progress we've made using uh, nano focused X ray beams uh, for hard X ray microscopy, both structural microscopy in two D and three D, and also uh, in the time domain. Uh, and I did put in a couple slides about the APS upgrade. I think a couple people have spoken to this before, but it, it really is a game changer in terms of these approaches, and it really will help them get to the depth of their potential for, uh, especially for semiconductor research, I feel. So just talk a bit more about that. Uh, and then I'll go through some recent results we've had uh, looking at implantation-induced stress and intrinsic defects in uh, silicon carbide and diamond, and as well as uh, looking at acoustic dynamics. And these are dynamics uh, driven uh, through uh, these semiconductor systems and the ways we can use the uh, photon source to actually image these uh, dynamics in real space and in time. And of course, these experimental results are coming out of our recent uh, efforts and infrastructure investments for looking at these uh, uh, systems as material hosts for quantum information sciences is why bang up semiconductors with optically active defects. But I really feel that a lot of these um, scientific questions in terms of you know control of defects, uh, interfaces, uh, origins of noise, dynamic response, systems integration, like a, lo a lot of these uh, are, are shared between semiconductor research. So hopefully some of these results will point the way towards, uh, you know, newer experiments and then we'll look to the future. Uh, yeah, so as as I mentioned, I'm, I'm uh, uh, from the uh, Nano uh, Center, just to give you a bit of context, the Center for Nanoscale Materials is one of the five nanoscale science research centers in the country. And e each one are built in conjunction with a facility for advanced imaging or advanced fabrication. We are here built into the wall of the advanced photon source, which is not, not just an architectural statement. We're actually working uh, quite closely with a number of sectors uh, uh, on uh, uh, a means for advanced characterization of nano systems and nanoscale dynamics. And we uh, built and operate the hard X-ray nanoprobe beamline at uh, sector 26, which I'll be talking most about. But I do want to just put this in context. There's a lot of other things that the Nano Center provides that you can get to with a single user proposal. Uh, and this provides a bit of a materials control loop that is entirely accessible to outside users. So not just synthesis, but also uh, nanoscale fabrication techniques, ultra low temperature uh, transport measurements, 
uh, both uh, advanced electron microscopy and scanning tunneling microscopy, uh, the ultrafast electron microscope, uh, as well as new, our new probe corrected instruments uh, that use these bringing online, are a huge complement to our expert capabilities as well, as well as photonics, and then also uh, theoretical development, multi-scale modeling to kind of tie it together. So I, I just, I feel like these facilities are really well suited for, for you know, local deployment of, um, you know, process steps that might be highly um, questionable, <laughs> exploratory, let's just say. <laughs> and so being able to rapidly close the loop between a small scale deployment of these sort of processes and what they actually look like with these advanced techniques, I think is the way to go for some of these uh, microelectronics research questions. So yeah, folks have talked about it. I do want to bring up the breadth of materials physics that you can access with these synchrotron sources, because it often gets a bit lost just how much you can do here and folks tend to try to use these different beam lines for you know as a one size fits all approach as opposed to kind of uh, bridging the length scales and time scales that you, know, you have available to you and this is by no means exhaustive i'm just kind of pulling out the things that i thought would be most relevant uh, as as uh, dylan was talking about as well uh, you can use back coherent diffraction imaging to resolve 3D structures and sort of paint structural informations onto them uh, in real space uh, and we do similar uh, work with uh, nanofocused hard x-rays. It's more of a scanning probe approach that's suitable for extended samples and samples in more complex environments. Um, and both of these rely on the fundamental sensitivity of the light to the structural perturbations. And that's the point, to my mind, of creating these sources at these one angstrom wavelengths, is that your 10 to the minus 4 bandpass of that wavelength gives you access to strain on the fidelity of 10 to the minus 4 over this uh, uh, relative to this wavelength. So it's really orders of magnitude beyond what you can get to with even the, the best uh, electron microscopes, even though, of course, our spot size and scanning resolution are quite a bit uh, smaller, in addition to you know core level edge spectroscopy and the other things that uh, Dylan was speaking to. But you can also tune the energy to look at excitations. Uh, so these fundamental electronic excitations by using uh, these intermediate electron uh, intermediate energy X-ray scattering, also fundamental uh, you know uh, dynamics of the system, the phonon dispersion using an elastic scattering as well, and looking in situ, so into active growth environments, CVD growth, uh, also etching, uh, high temperature, and being able to probe uh, structures beyond that. And as uh, Dylan was speaking to, there's beautiful results at X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy that can also be looked at for this kind of uh, self-assembled uh, growth and morphology changes of these, you know, uh, either uh, black copolymer driven or, you know, electrostatically driven uh, kind of bottoms up integration. Um, obviously, all these things are going to get 100 times better due to the uh, brilliance, but I, I did kind of want to amplify what it is that brilliance actually gets you. Uh, it's a hundred times increase in beam coherence and coherence is the ultimate driver of these imaging methods. It's the fidelity by which real space perturbations can be encoded onto an x-ray waveform. And we use that in multiple different ways. We use the diffractive optics to focus our beam down to a 20 nanometer beam spot using these 15 nanometer, well actually 10 nanometer now, uh, outermost zone uh, zone plates uh, here at the nanoprobe. This will get 100 times better. Uh, bright coherent diffraction imaging, of course, relies on the coherent fra uh, fraction beam photon correlation spectroscopy, actually because that uses the correlation of two different measurements above Poisson statistics, the fidelity that gets up as the brightness squared. So it could potentially be 10,000 times better. A and as Dylan was speaking to, give you enough of a momentum space view to get down to the atomistic level of uh, uh, fluctuations in this sort of microsecond to millisecond to second time scale. And that's that's also important for these devices, right? If you view each of these transistor objects as you know virtual defects in a larger field of view, you can look at correlated dynamics and correlated noise and heat transfer because correlated noise is death for these uh, device stacks. A lot of the noise mitigation strategies result, uh, depend on having each of these nodes being uh, independently experiencing a noise. And if there's some structures that are more, you know, driven by these collective excitation, that's actually something that's quite interesting uh, in terms of 3D device fabrication. And of course, psychography. And that movie was actually made here from the X-ray science division uh, using tech laminography. Okay, uh, and there's of course entirely new beam lines being built on these principles and will be available for use uh, as it comes up. Uh, this high energy beam coherence, uh, as a few speakers were alluding to, is, is, is very different in that it, a coherent experiment that could tolerate, for example, thin silicon nitride windows 
can now tolerate thin stainless steel windows, right? I mean, this is entirely different types of chemistry and aggressive environments. Our focus being microscopy, which is getting down now to 100 times flux, can approach the single uh, defect limit in terms of optical luminescence uh, from these very bright emitters, which we can use as registration for 3D tachography as well. Okay, uh, not to harp on this, but yeah, there, there are several source upgrades all coming up in the same time frame. Uh, you have what is essentially a continuous source that's getting vastly more coherent and an ultra coherent source that is getting vastly more continuous. And this lets them pack more photons effectively into this you know, femtosecond time slices with a much more homogeneous shot to shot distribution, which allows you to then you know, legitimately approach different types of microscopy and different types of inelastic X-ray scattering for you know, ultra fast uh, photo emission and things like that, right? Like this is, this is going to be quite different here, of course, APS upgrade, and we have domain expertise. We're looking to bridge these two techniques into how uh, you know, suitably nuanced real space microscopy can inform ultrafast diffraction, and you know, can ultrafast diffraction be used to deep blur the slower synchrotron source? Questions like that we're you know, quite interested in. Okay, so just to go over kind of uh, our approach to the beamline, we uh, take a monochromatic uh, source from this uh, a slice from this undulator. Right now, we are uh, treating the beam to actually create a virtual coherent fraction. This will be removed under the upgrade, which is the main difference for the beamline. And this will immediately give us two orders of magnitude higher flux here into this 20 nanometer uh, beam spot. Um, and this lets us assess the morphology. Uh, the uh, stoichiometry, chemical distribution, also identification of trace elements, uh, as uh, the uh, previous speaker from NIST was uh, referring to, all in the context of uh, lattice strain. And so we're able to then look at the uh, physical truncations and then also the uh, structural perturbations inside of the object. Uh, so we can develop the time resolved variance of that by relying on the pulsed nature of the source. And this is gathering these bunches into what is currently about 30 picosecond RMS bunches. Uh, and that will, of course, go up to about 90 picoseconds under the upgrade. But that gives you effectively a pulse source of x-rays at this. And you can build your entire experiment at a fixed time slice relative to a dynamic process. So we can either synchronize this with an RF stimulation of the sample, which we use to create acoustic waves, but could also be used to create you know, heat and piezo response in 3D device techs. Uh, we can look at the electrical signal coming out, uh, which lets us look at carrier recombination rates in photovoltaics as well as uh, you know, sort of near interface uh, 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 band activity and transport that's sort of similar to transient spectroscopy, uh, just the x-ray equivalent of that. Uh, and of course, then with a laser, we can optically pump uh, photo excited phase transitions and uh, watch them in real space and in, in, in this uh, time sense. And we can also treat these beams by deleting some of these uh, uh, Bunches uh, using high speed chopper to give you a flexible dark time for system recovery. Okay, uh, here's some examples looking at operando systems. Uh, we can look at stress transfer in, in these uh, fabricated stacks. It sees how these, uh, you know, top deposited electrode structures actually transfer all the way down to uh, uh, 2D electron gases deeper in the heterostructure simply by tuning to the different diffraction conditions. We can look at surface acoustic waves being driven through the uh, material, I'll talk more about that. And also these extended defects in due to growth uh, perturbations, excuse me, that we can image in, uh, in three dimensions. And also more complex things. So you can look at thin films that are under a great deal of distortion, or uh, this is actually a diamond thin film uh, that was used through the smart cut technique uh, developed at the University of Chicago and uh, at Argonne and QNEXT. Uh, to be able to bend these thin diamond sheets and create uh, different strain tuning of the uh, defect emission. Uh, and so it helps resolve sort of the structural component of these structure function uh, relationships. Okay, so how do we do this? There's sort of two main capabilities to keep track of, one of which is this uh, Bragg projection tachography originally developed by Stefan's group at Material Science Division that lets us look within these uh, fabricated heterostructures and interpret the far field scattering patterns as uh, you know, both strain and uh, curvature gradients, both in uh, one dimension, two dimension, and actually utilizing the detector viewpoint of the illuminated coherent volume, you can do this in three dimensions. That was a key development uh, that uh, uh, Stefan got to a few years back where you're able to then use the scanning dimension in sort of an analog of uh, light sheet fluorescence microscopy 
uh, to be able to create a three-dimensional image of three-dimensional strain uh, without rotating the sample uh, at all. And of course, by synchronizing this time source, you can look at uh, uh, you know, dynamic processes. All right, this can also be done in correlation with uh, electron microscopy. And those are some of the things that we're trying to bridge. Uh, this is work uh, with Yuzi Lu. Uh, we're able to look at the same copper oxide nanoparticle, both in the uh, electron micros microscope and also out at the beamline in the same scanning cell. So in the same gas flow cell, being able to activate this uh, photocatalytic reaction of CO2 at the edge of these copper oxide particles and through core level spectroscopy out at the beam line, uh, we're able to look at the catalytic rates per facet identified in the electron microscope. Uh, similarly, in photovoltaics, we're able to make these strain maps match up to optical luminescence shifts and uh, questions of actually being induced stability. And then you can also look at these uh, hybrid um, uh, uh, quantum well uh, 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 sort of uh, nanosticks that were able to look at cathode luminescence shifts sort of in context with the crystallographic shift from wood site to zinc dime. Uh, and that can be mapped at the beam line, mapped electron microscope, and then we can give it back. Uh, so because it's a non-destructive technique, they were able to, at uh, Northwestern, use the uh, atom probe tomography to look at the very small chemical perturbations that were driving these structural instabilities. Anyway, sorry, just blowing through a couple of examples to give you an idea of what is sort of possible by this type of microscopy. This is, of course, going to be get 100 times better, which <laughs> means 100 times more photons. So we're upgrading the beamline. These two things have been uh, commissioned during user studies this year, and we're currently building this next generation microscope. And that's going to be really cool because it'll actually let you have a direct optical view of the surface, both for optical luminescence, spectroscopy, and collection, as well as uh, you know pump probe stimulation. And we should have three orders of magnitude of selectable focus. So both having a 10 nanometer zone plate and 100 nanometer zone plate on the same scanning platform, and then a one micron beam uh, with a CRL lens outside the chamber. And that's really important. It's hard to do with hard X-rays, but then you can see uh, nanoscale perturbation sort of in the context of a larger uh, uh, environment or device stack uh, with statistical significance, uh, because that's the part that microscopy is really lacking. Um, so dealing with this data stream is also going to be, you know, pretty challenging. This is recent work with Tao Zhou and Matthew Cherkara out at the beamline, uh, creating what is essentially a live view trained model of uh, transmission technography using uh, high performance computing. So this uh, is, so this is the outgoing diffraction pattern, which you see looks a bit like a donut with the central stop here in the middle. This is the focused x-ray beam coming through the sample. And you would typically only get this data and some poor graduate student would have to go analyze it, you know, years after you take the data. But here we compact the uh, phase retrieval process into a GPU uh, piece that creates a training data set in high performance computing to train a recognition based model. And this is then redeployed on the edge. So right at the beam line, being able to give you a live update um, view of actually what the density is at each scanning location. And that lets us look at irreversible dynamics down to this, you know, video frame rate, one kilohertz detector, you know, millisecond type time slices. And that's pretty exciting because we really haven't been able to get there before. Okay, sorry, long preamble. Uh, let's take a look at some of these semiconductor systems. Uh, this is the first step is looking at these uh, ion implantation steps because especially for quantum materials, the uh, deterministic positioning of defect clusters is, and the, the control of the stochastic processes used to create them, is of primary importance to kind of using these things for sensing arrays or computation. And here we're able to look at these uh, defect rays uh, created in Sandia, uh, but with silicon implantation into silicon carbide, we can look at the residual strain around them. Here's actually a viewpoint of like what the detector is seeing per pixel. And most of this doesn't know about the defect cloud. And there's a small little wing of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, expansive strain near the defect uh, that you can actually kind of resolve and pull out the local strain uh, as you as you kind of walk across it. But it's not just sort of an in situ strain map, which is important for the, um, you know, especially for annealing steps and figuring out how to control that. But we can also see things that are optically quiet uh, that you wouldn't be able to resolve through uh, optical methods. For example, here in this, uh, this look at a, a overview map of a, a scattering array, and by the way, just to kind of answer the question of the previous speaker, we're sort of getting down to the, uh, you know, 100 of defect level, <laughs> so 500 defect with a loving eye. Uh, we can try to get down to this level, I think, with the upgrade. We'll see how that goes. Um, but 
then your question is, hey, what is this extremely large thing blowing through my scanning area? And that is actually the tail of a slip dislocation um, that has a, a dislocation core within silicon carbide. And so within the actual uh, 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 crystallographic unit, you can kind of find this, find the performance of these, you know, more or less uh, defects that you actually would like to have in your system in the context of a very complex local environment. And since you can find this dislocation core, you can see this very uh, uh, atomic scale interface of strain variation in real space. And this is very difficult to access through other coherent diffraction methods that can't easily uh, laterally scan, right? And then we can give it back to Sandy and they can start depositing defects that are bridge these interfaces and they're independently addressable, even though there's only there might only be 20 or 30 nanometers apart. Um, okay, cool. And we can also look at multiple Bragg uh, projections of the same defect to be able to kind of create a virtual stereoscopic view. And this is a very kind of cheap way of doing three dimensional images because a Bragg diffraction is, of course, relatively sparse in angle. But for uh, modelable defects like pipe defects, it's really quite good that we can look at these defect structures to about you know, 20 to 50 nanometer precision within about a five micron cube volume. And this lets us understand. Uh, defects used for uh, quantum imaging. Uh, they're also going to be using this for dark matter detection. Uh, I was pretty excited about this because this is the first time I can put uh, uh, I can I can put you know light years and nanometers on the same view graph. Um, of course, uh, so yeah. The 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 idea with these weakly interacting massive particles is there's a lot of undesirable background coming from the sun in terms of neutrinos, but. That's all sort of at a fixed planar intersection to a detector, depending on the Earth's rotation. And most of the dark matter is actually coming out of plane. And so if you can actually recognize and find the aspect ratio of these defect tracks that are embedded in the diamond, you can eliminate most sources of noise in the detection of dark matter. So they're planning to use X-ray microscopy actually for that with one meter cubed of diamond because their funding is larger than my funding, of course. <laughs> um, Okay, acoustic dynamics. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you also a bit because people were talking about heat transport on the uh, pump probe experiment uh, that we uh, recently done driven uh, by, uh, you know, uh, Haidan and Yunchun. Uh, and this is looking at a phase transition going across a photo excited phase transition uh, within the context of this sort of unique local volume. So we can microstructurally map this one micron little square uh, at, at, you know, kind of a 20 nanometer level. And then understand the, uh, the sort of transition that's being bound by the frozen heterogeneity, the microstructure and the mosaicity within that unique little real space imprint and how the heat transport then re-equilibrates within it. And I think that gets to some of the questions of metastability and uh, overall you know, response to frozen disorder that uh, some of the other speakers were, were, were talking to too. So. Uh, this has also been done in terms of overlapping uh, this sort of nanoscale mapping with uh, LCLS style uh, uh, ultra-fast diffraction is that if you know the real space ordering of this uh, kind of uninteresting mosaic disorder, you can actually understand the scattering uh, stability that you're seeing on these ultra-fast timescales within the context of this you know, real space pattern. So like this work has sort of already been done and I feel like this is gonna be getting a lot better uh, under the upgrade. And so that's something to keep track of. Uh, okay, acoustic dynamics. So this is looking at silicon carbide dive vacancy clusters, which are optically active defects that uh, have a good quantum behavior actually up until room temperature and relatively high coherence. Uh, they interact with the strain actually uh, quite strongly. Uh, and uh, the speed of sound is isotropic. So the University of Chicago folks uh, in David Ashon's group were able to create these cool Gaussian focusing resonator structures that drive acoustic waves uh, through these materials. And then mechanically you can dress the spin states and use them to flip spins. And we can look at this with the synchrotron, you sort of match up these uh, X-ray pulses with the uh, higher frequency Acoustic wave, this can be up to you know gigahertz style. And you're missing a lot of these waves, but then you come in at the same point in each of them. And then you can advance the phase uh, to be able to actually map out the curvature. So you map in two dimensions at a fixed time slice. So if I pick a fixed spatial position, I can actually see this temporal oscillation directly on the detector. There's sort of this small curvature change given by the Gaussian focusing of the acoustic wave and this larger curvature change driven by the 
progression of the acoustic wave. But both of these are order microrads. So we're basically invisible to all other kinds of microscopy that isn't really caring about uh, uh, crystallographic mirror planes. But this lets you map out them in real space over this kind of 20, 30 micron region, what this uh, wave actually looks like and how it's interacting with the scattering structure that we put in here. It's this etch pit that we use for the photoluminescence measurements and to register everything. And so you can, you know, if for each position in this map, you get a full time slice of two orthogonal vector components of strain. And that lets you match up and use the material as kind of a palette to understand the relationship. Uh, you can do the same thing in volume. These are recent results uh, with uh, Cornell. They create these high overtone uh, bulk acoustic resonators. It's made out of thin films here. And so then within the volume of the material, you get uh, uh, a driven these acoustic waves uh, at a brag angle. And it's kind of sampling then this alternating strain pattern that then has multiple components of strain in the same object. And actually two major components just because you kind of have two modes there, but you can understand these scattering the patterns uh, changing within the context of a uh, model, which uh, was developed later on. But here you can see in two dimensions, then this uh, 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 H-bar device banging away uh, uh, with the uh, uh, acoustic strain. Okay, so uh, he was able to actually create a model that looked at the projection of this volume strain along the beam path. And it not only reproduced the splitting, but it also sort of reproduced the gradient in between it and the relative, uh, you know, kind of asymmetric shift of both of these uh, peaks. So they were able to actually uh, extract reasonably good strain values as a function of time through this entire oscillation. And you can see the peak to peak strain of like kind of you know, seven times 10 to the minus four or five times 10 to the minus three, like it, it's, it's relatively low in terms of actual strain in the material, but you can see just how clear it is uh, on the detected value um, and being able to kind of create these models that goes beyond the, uh, the blurring of the monochromaticity of the beam. And this is kind of interesting because I, I think this bridges nicely into looking at semiconductors, not in terms of acoustics, but actually in terms of heat. Uh, because the, if you think about the thermal expansion coefficient or what to expect for changes in temperature, if you have a detection sensitivity or limit that's around 10 to the minus five, you can think about trying to actually image heat at about a 10 Kelvin change with a 20 nanometer beam. Uh, and that's not great for a lot of things, but there are these, these different device structures like uh, bipolar transistors that you know, are, are, are quite a bit faster. Um, but generate a lot more heat or uh, on-chip photonics that are actually receiving a lot of optical energy in a very localized area where the operating temperatures are actually quite a bit above what one would expect and like how to mitigate that and how to separate these components out. We can answer that question in real space. If in the limit, in the, in the limit that nothing else is going on like piezo response or, you know, uh, other electrically induced strain. Anyway, just kind of food for thought. Okay, uh, so looking to the future, obviously the upgrade is at the diffraction limit, which is literally the best thing you can do for microscopy. And we're attempting to bridge this into three dimensions, this recent work by Tao Zhou that's able to distribute the dynamical diffraction uh, by solving takagi toppen equations in a, in a graph format that allows it to directly use automatic differentiation. This is a very inexpensive, well, relatively inexpensive way to uh, recreate a three-dimensional volume that's dynamically diffracting. Uh, synthetic data looks relatively good. Uh, Matthew Cherikara has been able to uh, go beyond the overlap limits of the uh, traditional typography. So we're sort of at an exciting time where new methods of edge computing or analytical approaches are going beyond fidelity limits and fidelity limits themselves are going up by two orders of magnitude. So, I'd really encourage everyone that's still here and, and still listening to, um, you know, rethink their scientific priorities because all of the rules of thumb that we have in terms of what is possible and what is not, you know, <laughs> that we've painfully developed for 20 years, you know, are wrong. <laughs> like they're not wrong by a little bit, they're wrong by like two orders of magnitude. So if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I don't have enough photons for this, or, you know, I don't have enough processors to do this calculation with the advent of exascale computing at Argon, like all, all of these things are kind of coming in a narrow time slice. And it's really worth it to kind of take a fresh look at, at what's possible and what's not. Um, so yeah, I'd like to thank everyone that I've been working with uh, both here at Argon, Matthew, Barack, Haidan, and Stefan. 
uh, and uh, Joe Hermans and Mazar, who are here, uh, Gregory at um, Cornell, and uh, of course, David at University of Chicago. So thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks, Martin. It's a great talk. So it's very uh, fantastic for a, new, a lot of new capability. So, yeah, so let me see if any question from our audience uh, for Martin. Yeah, quick question, Martin. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, if you want to study a structure through a gate, what, what would be a good technique among the many that you outlined? Yeah, uh, so the individual structures under applied voltage and uh, field, I think are really best done with this uh, type of nanofocus diffraction microscopy. And we've been looking at you know, a lot of these also the nickelates um, and uh, have some, you know, results, I, I think, you know, of course, uh, with, with uh, uh, along those lines, but also in terms of driven um, structural effects, like the forming and, and disassociation of these kind of electroformed filaments, uh, all that is kind of best done here. And uh, the, if it is radiation stable enough, you can also look at that in terms of reversible dynamics. So the actual process itself is irreversible, but there's limits by which you can look at the, the, the reversible component that's sort of below the threshold for creating the irreversible piece. And then understand this, much like crack propagation, you can understand the uh, driven component in the context of an energy landscape that's sort of very uniquely and locally defined. And, I, I think that the nanoscale x-rays really get at that very nicely because you don't have to use uh, 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 a lot of uh, kind of model dependent analysis and it's sensitive to these outliers, these sort of local areas that branch in the unit landscape. So I'm sorry, I'm not sure that answers your question, but that's- Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, I think at the end you mentioned this very interesting, you know, let's, uh, you know, you can reimagine many things and not be limited by, you know, what, what happened 20 years back, you know, if you, you know, just a quick scan through many of the presentations today, uh, and also just from the literature, many of the semiconductors being considered for, you know, AI, neuromorphic computing, even quantum computing, perhaps, you know, none of them are uh, perfect single crystal structures that would be useful. I mean, you know, we almost always consider incorporating large number of defects of different types to get the function. Uh, so I wonder if, you know, in terms of characterizing new semiconductors, maybe there needs to be a rethink of, you know, the metrology for studying, you know, materials that are totally the opposite of silicon. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree, especially as they're speaking to using more elements of the periodic table, mm -hmm. being able to do edge identification, turn on and off defects as a function of temperature and as a function of beam spectroscopy, you can identify the, their role as well as kind of their identity and where they are approximately to things. And that's that's sort of the dream scenario. Like, I, I, I think we'll need to really put a lot of pieces together to do it, but it's exciting that it's possible now. Thank you. So any question? Uh, so, Martin, uh, you show a schematic for the new uh, uh, chamber for the nanoprobe, right? So, so in the future, so nanoprobe gonna have a, this uh, sample uh, stage gonna have a you know all kind of degree freedom, right? Compared to right now, right? Well, the sample stage is going to have approximately the same in that kind of we have one continuous axis of rotation and then a couple of tilt 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 axis to do it. But we should be able to fly scan the sample to a larger beam and fly scan the optics with a smaller beam. And then you can kind of zoom in with this understanding your sample using a one micron focus beam into a hundred nanometer beam into a 10 nanometer beam in the same on the same platform with it loaded into uh, the uh, piece. The, uh, the Cryogenic development is 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 you know work in progress, but we're we're hoping to to get a much better design for that as well. Okay, so yeah, because I see the diagram, I saw maybe you have a new way for sample manipulator, which is give you like the full goniometer, like a six degree. Freedom. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. So the detector, uh, uh, the detector uh, manipulation. I'm just going to roll back here. Uh, the detector manipulation is quite a bit different. Um, 
And so, yeah, so this guy actually lets us very flexibly interrogate a lot of scattering space mm -hmm. coming out. Yep. Uh, and then you can actually walk through your momentum transfer using continuous rotation here, as well as, uh, you know, uh, small amounts of tip tilt. Small amount of tilt. Okay. So you yeah. basically, okay, have those yeah, uh, yeah. You know, options. But uh, yeah, but the main, the main advance is really being able to get this, the, both the uh, fluorescence microscopy and the optical spectroscopy out of the same scattering volume, because distributing dose is going to be key in not killing the sample and being able to do that deterministically is very important. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And also for the tying our resolutions so because after upgrade, so our like um, the, the pulse structure as well change, right? You know, there are no yeah. any more 40, you know, 24 bunch bone, 40A and 324. And also the pulse duration become much longer, a lot larger, like 250 something picosecond rather than 80 or 90 right now. So yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, so yeah. what, what, where's the 90 picosecond? R oh, you talk RMS. Okay. RMS. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, that, that's probably not the greatest thing, but that's, that's what it's, what's on the thing, but you're right. Yeah. That's the kind of 200, 300 picosecond. So I, what I do feel when I sort of put that up in the conclusions is it's still really good for this nanosecond nanoscale dynamics. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's, that's the sweet spot. And that yeah. is a lot of interesting stuff yeah. in these, yeah. you know, gigahertz style, Bigger, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Pieces the, and yeah. the slower recombination of energy in it. Uh, you know, and I think there's been a lot of clever ideas that I know Hyde has been working on, I've been working on in terms of beam slicing and trying to actually chop up these pulses. Oh, you're using chopper. Okay. Chop, chop well, structure. Well, so. You know, it, it's more if you can introduce a, a high speed deformation into one pulse, you can use the pulse subtraction of the Iger to actually create a negative image that's a much tighter, um, effective. You know, pulse width than you had before, but I, I'm sorry. Anyway, that's just things for the future. But I think we're compatible. I'm sorry, Dylan said his hand up for forever. So, uh, no, no, I just put it up. I do have a question. I mean, I've had problems before with beam damage on some samples. After the upgrade, I don't know if it's going to be necessarily uh, much much different. But do you have a good feeling for what materials, what systems? Uh, suggestions as to what what uh, might be better in terms of avoiding beam damage strategies for avoiding beam damage or what well, we'll take it as it goes yeah that's that's a really good point and i think the key there's sort of two levels to the question and one of which is uh, the ability to sort of share methodologies to deal with it because i mean people still it's 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 it's, it's not a reason not to do electron microscopy it yeah. is a reason to you know, come up with standard understood protocols that people get in terms of reducing charging, reducing, you know, operating at cryogenic temperatures, you, you, you know, dose mitigation strategies, all of that we need to develop because there've been, you know, literally two or three beam lines in the world capable of doing that previously. Mm -hmm. Now, basically everybody's at that limit. So what our approach is now, and we do actually modify with the beam about 50% of the samples or the types of samples we look at. And I feel that'll go up to most of them <laughs> before is that you have to self consistently understand the, uh, the, the rate of change of your sample. And I don't mean damage because it is a chemical activity more than like heat or yeah. charging. Uh, so your oxide films in particular have high oxygen mobility. Uh, in these things, these actually kind of silicon, silicon germanium structures that don't have a buried oxide layer are very resilient, but things mm -hmm. near oxygen then now have this nice tunnel <laughs> to hop the oxygen through. Um, so, you know, things like that in terms of, okay, well, how do you mitigate that? Or what kind of capping layers that we didn't need to think about before can, I'm coming at it from the back end of, hey, how fast can I scan? Right, and what? When do I need to stop before I take images? And the sparse sample tachography is key to that because you can tune a way lower dose gradient than you would think in order to get a high fidelity image with this deterministic smart scanning of defocus beams that aren't even overlapping with each other. Do you see what I mean? So, so oh, I feel okay. that the analytical techniques and the scanning capabilities are going to meet in the middle a bit to help, but it's obviously a huge concern. Hmm. Yeah, the, the 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 fastest you know a flying type of mode, and you know that's definitely you know way to go. So you know we 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 compare something like a highlight pro sky. You know we we can we can do pretty successfully transmission tachography because they're flying very fast. You know each individual spot and they have very very short you know time exposure. But we do CDI 
you know, not very easy successful because the CDI always like, you know, focus to one spot. So the, the, the grain decay very quickly. Yeah. A fly is really the way to. Yeah, move. but uh, I believe we're going to start hitting fundamental limits and Dylan's quite uh, right to bring it up because the, you, you think of x-ray microscopy as being non-invasive, but if you think about it as Chris Jacobson actually calculated directly, if you think about it from a fidelity standpoint, the dose that you need to get the same contrast image that you would get through electrons is like hundreds of times more. So we're yeah. actually relatively yeah. inefficient if you want good images. Good image, yeah, that's right. Okay. So, yeah. so yeah. you know, I, I think this is going to give us the tools to get to those limits. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think you just hear it because the TEN yeah. community, have, there's a low dose, you know, meso, but I don't know whether low dose yeah. for x-ray yeah. is going to be just not easy to achieve. Okay. Use yeah, it. that is, I'm going to ask for the, for the, for the e-beam, it's very easy to control the dosage. And still, you, we still have the good beam shape. But for the X-ray, is that easy to modulate the dosage? You still maintain the same quality of the beam or probe? Yeah, yeah, it's, it is relatively easy to attenuate uh, oh. uh, upstream and to remove. Um, if you want to do it, uh, you can also kind of do it in a gradient standpoint by defocusing, but that's a, that's a physical defocusing. So you, now you're talking about moving an optic that is you know 20 to maybe 15 nanometer beam width back hundreds of microns. Uh, and you have to kind of register that uh, with, with your scanning. Um, but yeah, yeah there's, there's thing... flexible ways to do the dose, but that's why I think some of this analytical approaches are gonna be really important to be able to say immediately, hey, do I have enough data to stop taking the experiment? Like adaptively make that decision. A grad student would say no, <laughs> right? A grad <laughs> student would say, no, let me turn up the beam and take data for hours and hours just to make sure but if the algorithm says, yes, you're done, you have your picture, then, you know, faster than a human time scale can do, right? Now you're in a whole different regime of dose mitigation, I think. Yeah, another thing is, yeah, you just mentioned the fast imaging or fast uh, fly scanning. So I know a lot of faster cameras for the electron microscope actually is from the X-ray. So yeah, this is, the question is uh, the fast, detector for the x-ray can can help to mitigate the the, the damage as well right i yeah. just like uh, you you skin very fast you make sure you have the fast camera to pick up all the all yeah. the data in short time yeah. yeah the exit photons are precious you can always yeah. attenuate before the sample interaction but everything you lose after the sample interaction is what kills you in terms of imaging yeah, and so being able to kind of do this high speed thing that how it's been developing is is super important, I feel. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Thank you. So any more questions? So yeah, we have a pretty nice uh, talk today from different topic, from device, from metrology, and also synchrotron characterization, and also, you know, first to talk about talk about a lot, a lot of the device and also the device physics. So I think it's, it's pretty, uh, uh, you know, inclusive and diverse topic to cover today. So if uh, we don't have any more questions, yeah, we probably want to just conclude. It's all, already like 5.20. So it's a little bit over the time. So don't, don't uh, you know, forgot tomorrow morning, uh, Friday morning, starting from nine o'clock, we have another session for a microelectronics workshop. We have another five talk and you know, cover different topic, uh, you know, direct relevant to microelectronics. We also have a one people from industry, uh, you know, talk about how do the really industry take care of the 2D material into their R and D, you know, or even future production lines. Okay, so Ayuzu, uh, do you have anything to say? Where we can wrap up today? I think we can wrap up and uh, don't forget to come back tomorrow. Thank you so much. Yeah, come back tomorrow, nine o'clock. So, okay, thanks everyone. Thanks for sticking, you know, with our discussion. Bye bye. We'll see everyone in the morning. <laughs>